Good afternoon, everyone. I am Shipra Swal. I am Gaurav Nandi. We are research fellow from Center for Nano Technology. Welcome you all again. It gives us immense pleasure to extend online familiarization workshop on 2D nano transistor and energy device technology on behalf of INUP team. Now, the next talk of the day is FinFET nano sheet transistor technology for beyond Murray application by Professor Sudeep Das Gupta. Professor Sudeep is currently working as professor in microelectronics and VLSI group in Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering at IIT Roorkee. He received his PhD degree in Electronics Engineering from IIT BHU Varanasi in year 2000. He is uh, a member of. No, no need to like they will get it from the website, right? Don't. Okay. Uh, thank okay, you for sir. the introduction, nonetheless, right? Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay, with this introduction, I request Professor Sudeep to throw light on the topic. During sure, the sure. session, participants are requested to mute their mic and drop their queries in the chat box, which will be taken at the end of the talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you, both of you. Uh, and thanks uh, to INAP at IIT Guwahati to uh, provide me opportunity to discuss my work with a larger community uh, within India. So with this, let me start today's uh, uh, just a minute. So is this visible to all of you, the first slide? Yes, sir. So I, you need to full screen the PPT. Uh, yes, but then there is a problem when I do a slideshow. Uh, is this full screen now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Correct, correct, good. Uh, just a minute. So thanks a lot once again, and uh, uh, welcome to this talk on FinFET nano sheet based transistor technology for for beyond mood applications. And uh, let me do one thing. Let me switch off my camera, and then I can move ahead. Right now, uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, what we are looking into is uh, with constant mini miniaturization. Uh, we need to have a variety of uh, transistor uh, layouts and uh, and uh, uh, issues which will let us move uh, beyond the traditional uh, mood slow application. So that's the reason I thought of uh, bringing this in front of you. And uh, this is in the this is the main building which you see in the front. And this building is our James Thompson building which was built in 1850. So we are about 175 years old institute. And uh, uh, this is where our director, deputy director, everybody sits. So just for information, this is the overall administrative center of the IIT. Okay, so let me come to the next slide and give you an idea about what we are supposed to do in next about 50, 55 minutes, right? And uh, what we will look into is we will give you an idea about uh, the growth in CMOS technology in the last uh, two decades specifically. Uh, then have a look at SOC migration to FinFETs. So what we are looking into is uh, you have these bulk, we have these bulk MOSFETs uh, uh, coming into picture. And these bulk MOSFETs are now being replaced by what are known as FinFETs. And then we will look at uh, the next evolution and that is basically known as the uh, nano sheet FETs, right? And then if time permits, we will be looking into the process of FinFET for IoT applications. Uh, where does it fits into the whole uh, nano electronics program which has come up in India is for all these FinFETs as well as uh, nano sheet domain, you require all these uh, uh, nano scale process, uh, process to be stabilized very well to have a high yield. Uh, that's where uh, your expertise as uh, a fabricated fabrication engineer will come into picture. And that's where the device engineer and fabricated fabrication engineers, they can actually join hands to develop uh, these, th this, these devices. However, the, the usage of these devices uh, for IoT applications are uh, most important because these are very, very, very energy constrained uh, IoT applications, because most of the time, say for example, you're having a sensor which is looking at the AQI of a city, right? And uh, once you want to, once wants to, so what you're doing, you're basically sampling the input 
and then either you're doing an edge computing at the edge where the sensor is, or you send the raw data to the cloud and the cloud does the computing. In either of the two methodologies, you require to have very, very large uh, energy efficiency because you don't want to replace the battery time and again. So that's where the second half of the talk possibly will look into the matter. And then we'll summarize, of course, uh, the overall idea. Now let's look at uh, uh, let's look at uh, the growth of devices, and therefore, on the left hand side, you will see the number of transistors per millimeter square, uh, which is there, and the right hand side, you see the switching energy uh, for the transistors. Right now, it, it and the and the time span is from 1999 to approximately 2029. So this is typically uh, about three decades of, of, of growth, which we see. Though you see this growth on the left-hand side, and this, this corresponds to this part, is linear, but since it's a log scale, you could expect that it's an exponential in nature. So you can obviously understand that this exponential growth in the number of transistor per unit area uh, is only possible because of mood. So, you see approximately, if you look very carefully, uh, this is 32 and the next node, I would expect it to be 16 nanometer, but 16 nanometer didn't work very well. We stabilized at 14 nanometer channel length. 14 would have actually gone to seven, but you have an intermediate node of 10 nanometer coming into picture. Seven would have easily gone to around three, but we have a five nanometer node coming in the middle. So you see, Post 2015, 2013, the growth has been most of a staggered growth in the domain of devices. But you are not able to follow drastically the Moore's law over a period of time, right? And therefore, we would expect to see that there was some tendency in devices. Please understand that the Moore's law for devices and for memories, they are quite different, right? For memory, it is much more stringent. For devices, it is less stringent. Around 2023, 24, which is currently, uh, we are somewhere in that region, we expect to see what is known as a gate all around nanosheet, right? And then suddenly around 27, 28, we will ex expect to see what is known as a stacked nanosheet. So these two are upcoming technologies, which I need to show to you as we move along. So FinFET is a very, very stabilized uh, technology available with you. and. The Denard scaling law, those who are aware of, they must they must be knowing that this is all discussion is with Denard uh, scaling law, right? This is Denard scaling, which we are looking into, right? And as a result, uh, you see that uh, if you are doing a constant voltage or constant electric field scaling, you get this type of growth in the number of devices as you move from a low technology node to high technology node. These nodes, 180 nanometer, 130 nanometer, are referred to as legacy nodes, right? These are referred to as legacy nodes, and they are generally uh, used for the purpose of analog mixed signal design. These nodes, which you see here, are basically low technology uh, or low uh, uh, low uh, nodes, uh, low nodes, and these are generally used for digital applications, right? And typically, digital applications uses such type of uh, nodes here. Look at the right hand side. Uh, the switching speed, the switching energy is also reducing drastically as you move from uh, uh, from uh, late 2000, uh, early 2000 to approximately 2030. You see these orange lines here, these orange, red, orange lines, you see almost 2030, you will be very close to about one actojoule energy, which is very, very small. Um, uh, those who are working in the domain of circuits, they will understand there is this concept of adiabatic, uh, adiabatic uh, uh, devices and adiabatic circuits, which actually works at very, very low energy, but the cost you pay for it is very, very large area and your layout areas are typically large. So this graph was to show to you that we are increasing in terms of transistor density and we are actually reducing in terms of switching energies and they are reducing drastically as you move ahead, right? So there will be some amount, some time after which you will get a saturation in terms of both of them, both the number of transistors as well as switching energies. So let's look at the impact of uh, uh, Moore's law. Uh, so the impact, all of you are aware of those who, those who are in domain of electronics will understand that typically in 2020, you have this mobile internet, right? 
and it would require approximately 10 billion, more than 10 billion units uh, of mobile internet, uh, which will cater to your requirement of um, smartphones, tablets, MP3s, right? Even even uh, nowadays uh, we are listening or we are we know that these are actually used for uh, for GPS monitoring in uh, automotive vehicles, right? In automotive vehicles. Uh, uh, you actually use your mobile internet to do that. Um, so the overall idea which I wanted to tell in front of you, uh, these two slides are that you will have an increased in integration. In increased integration primarily means more devices per unit area. That will result in more functionality per unit area. So we are looking into two very important aspects when we talk about uh, devices and circuits. The first uh, is basically uh, TOPS tops per watt, which means that for every one watt of power which you spend, how many trillion, trillion operations per second you are able to handle, right? This is tops per watt, which many in the circuit domain people use it. And we also look into the fact that we do two important points, power delay product, and third is basically your energy delay product. These three important parameters define uh, the figure of merit of a divine. If you look at this uh, red colored cartoon here, it tells me that as the transistor scaling takes place here, uh, and you go to a lower and lower dimension, you end up having a higher and higher performance, right? Uh, higher performance entails that uh, you will have a market growth. This market growth will bring in more investment. More investments means more investment. Investment means you can actually put large money into transistor scaling, right? Now, why does scaling brings about a higher performance? Very simple and straightforward. If those who are in domain of electrons will appreciate that the drain current is directly proportional to W by L, width by length of the transistor. So if you if you move ahead and say your length is going on reducing, your drain current will actually go on increasing. Once the drain current becomes larger and larger, then for a fixed value of capacitance, if my current becomes large, then this capacitance charging and discharging process will be fast, and therefore my tau will be small, and therefore my frequency will be large. Which means that if I don't do any manipulation in the Moore's law and just follow the channel length reduction, my drain current will increase. If there is a fixed capacitance which is to be charged or discharged, with increasing drain current, I would expect to see a faster charging and discharging of the capacitor, which means my tau will reduce, which means my frequency will increase, which, may, which means my, I have a higher performance, right? And this will result in market good investment, so on and so forth. So this was the, just an ordinary impact of Moore's law in terms of um, uh, idea. Okay, uh, so this, uh, uh, so this uh, uh, gives you an idea about uh, the IoT. So, uh, the second part, like the overall part is that, uh, can I use uh, technology uh, where IoT is one of the, one of the technologies uh, which necessitates very high energy efficiency and extremely low power consumption and reliability for long usage. So the three issues which I, which I uh, will re request you to uh, look into, and these are basically your high energy efficiency is one of the requirement, right? Extremely low power consumption is the second requirement. This is the first requirement. This is the second requirement. And the third requirement is the reliability. Operate reliability for a long time, which means that without any human intervention, these sensor nodes or wireless sensor nodes which are located at large distances or very remote distances should operate reliability for a long time without dropping the performance estimations, right? And it has been seen that FinFETs uh, happen to be one of the primarily uh, a good idea for high energy efficiency. Uh, not only that, uh, one major advantage of FinFET was that uh, you don't require to change your fab, right? You don't have to do not do not you don't have to do not change your fab. Your silicon fab is there, right? You have a silicon process flow. You don't have to do any change in the silicon process flow in order to insert FinFETs. And that is expected also, because if you don't do that, the fabricators won't be interested to take up because it will be very, very cost intensive process. So what what, what advantage of FinFET was that it gives gave you a very high current, 
very high energy efficiency and therefore i was able to integrate finfets in most of the ic design and most importantly it is very very energy efficient which means that it is able to do much larger tops per watt as compared to your bulk mosfet so this is the overall picture uh, which you see now let's look at your uh, your mobile soc migration to finfet now this is the story was uh, pre uh, pre 2013 2014 you had these bulk mosfets even at low technology nodes coming up now you have these finfets which are basically quasi planar in nature i will come to the structure later on which were actually integrated into the system on chip soc right and the first example of that was an 820 snapdragon uh, which was actually developed by qualcomm technologies uh, its first 14 nanometer product and then uh, 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 snapdragon 835 which was basically the first 10 nanometer product Uh, so as you are aware that uh, we require ppac which is power performance area and cost and the cost is obviously the function of the volume right and uh, and 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 the idea is please please look at the first part here this one and then look at this part here so most of your chips which you are designing all right in 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 low technology nodes uh, or for that matter any user uh, which you are putting we'll have a digital block right we'll have a digital block and it will be actually ha also have a, a analog block so you will digital block and have analog block digital block as i told to you works with this and this at 40 nanometer and 10 nanometer analog block still works at 180 130 90 nanometer and so on and so forth right because the performance of the analog blocks are much better at high technology nodes at low technology nodes uh, you end up having second order effects which might destroy the analog performance right and therefore the soc was actually driven by logic and memory units right uh, and and you need to scale down your logic and you need to scale uh, scale up your memory which means that for the same area the memory integration should be much larger and your logic integration should be much stronger so that you are able to insert more logic within a particular domain right and that is what the whole idea uh, was all about in this figure which you see on the right hand side uh, this is basically a mobile soc uh, where you have this uh, audio audio part which is primarily a uh, uh, ams or analog mix signal you have uh, you have you also have uh, these gpu and modems this modem is basically having adcs so you will see typically 20 to 30% will be ams and rest of them will be typical analog or uh, digital design in most of the soc which we have so the idea here is that to replace all these by uh, possibly by a finfet technology okay so let me now come to the basics of uh, device physics so that you are able to appreciate why we are going to finfet at the first place uh, uh, so the idea here is that Uh, you have this. You have this bulk MOSFET, right? In the bulk MOSFET, you have this gate, right? You have the source, and you have drain. Source is generally grounded, and on the drain side, you apply a bias VDS, drain to source. And on the gate voltage, you apply a apply a gate to source voltage. And this VGS, as you are aware, should be greater than the threshold voltage of the MOS device in order to switch on for an enhancement mode MOSFET. Now, <clears throat> look at the picture here on the left hand side. it consists of cox cox is nothing but the oxide capacitance uh, which is basically uh, the capacitance between the metal gate and the silicon so this is this is the metal gate and this is the silicon which you see here right this is the silicon which you see here and you have an oxide layer here so this is epsilon t uh, epsilon by tox uh, per unit area if you want to do it or epsilon not a by tox is basically my cox where a is the area which is given by w into l w is the width of the device and l is the length of the device with this basic idea you see you will also have a drain capacitance and you will have a bulk capacitance now the idea is if your drain capacitance is relatively high then for the same amount of gate voltage i will be able to accumulate more amount of electron near the drain side and therefore gate has to do lesser amount of effort 
in order to form the inversion layer in the channel. Whereas if your CB is larger than CD, then the electrons will be actually pushed back into the body and your gate has to do a larger, which means the threshold voltage will be larger in that case. So simply by uh, capacitor division, I will be able to generate a variation in the threshold voltage of the device. Now, with that background in your mind, uh, please look at the graph here. Uh, I am plotting log of ID uh, versus VGS, gate to source voltage, right? And uh, for, a, for when VGS equals to VDD, obviously my <coughs> device MOSFET, right, is in uh, behaving like an ideal uh, current source. If it is behaving like an ideal current source, my Z out output impedance is exactly equals to infinity. <coughs> and therefore, you will see this is almost constant here, constant here, which means that my drain current is almost independent of the applied drain bias. But as you lower your gate voltage, you see your current starts to drop down. Please understand, appreciate this is the log scale, right? This is the log scale which you see, and therefore, this is sort of an exponential drop which you see at this edge. And we define that this will there will be a subthreshold slope of approximately 60 millivolt per decade at 300 Kelvin, which means that at 300 Kelvin, for one decade change in the current, I require 60 millivolt change in the gate voltage, right? One decade means one milliamp to 10 to the power minus 3 to 10 to the power minus 4, you require 10, uh, 60 millivolt change in the gate voltage. Now, if you want this to be much better, the ideal value will be make the subthreshold slope as low as possible, which means that for a smaller change in the threshold voltage, a subthreshold uh, uh, slope, I will get a much larger change in the current, right? And as VGS reaches to this value, I end up having almost... Uh, I off, which is very, very small value, which means that even at I off, which means that even at gate voltage equals to zero, your there will be always a off current, which is very, very small in dimensions. Understand again log scale, and therefore you can appreciate that it will be relatively a small value. Just wait a minute. Huh? Sorry, um, there was some disturbance outside. Anyway, so I got this point, and and as you can see, steeper this uh, this graph, steeper this graph, better the device will be in terms of switching, right? And therefore, you will have a steeper subthreshold slope, and you will have a less dibble effect coming into picture. So in most of the cases which we look when we try to find out the figure of merit for a bulk device, I try to find out this parameter, I on by I off, right? I try to find out the on current, which is this, this one, divided by this current, I off. If this value is very large, then either I off is very low, which, is, which means the leakage is very small, or I sat or I on is very high, which means, which means that my driving current is also very large. This figure of merit needs to be raised drastically for the device to work properly in a proper domain. Now, let me come to the concept of fully depleted devices. And many people use, for example, Global Foundry uses FDSOI device at the 22 nanometer technology. And the reason being that their IOFs are relatively very, very small, almost near to zero. So ion by IOF ratios are really relatively very large for a fully depleted devices, right? Uh, what they do here is that, quite interestingly, that they have an undoped body here. This is this is almost zero doping here. And then the bottom plate, what you do is that you have a heavily doped a bottom plate, right? Under under the undoped body, right? And when you have this into consideration, uh, you have this uh, you have this uh, electric fields which are terminating, uh, which are starting from gate side. They will rather than terminating at the at the undoped region because you don't have any free charge carriers here, it will actually move towards the bottom gate, right? So there will be an electric field available with us. 
However, the bottom plate, since it is fully heavily doped, you will have free charge carriers as well as there will be fixed charge carriers. The termination of electric field will be taking place. This type of body, where you have, uh, where where there is, where, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is when it is fully depleted, we don't have any charge, right? When you don't have any charge, there is no leakage, and that's the whole idea of a. Uh, fully depleted body. Some of the implementations which you do in a fab are bulk, planar on bulk. We do planar on SOI. SOI is silicon on insulator, right? And then you use a 3D, which is basically a FinFET, and then 3D and SOI, uh, which we do. I will just give you there for a small example of how a FinFET looks like. And this is the first time uh, those who are un uninitiated will look into the fact. Is the first time where I can explain to you what FinFET is all about. Look at the left-hand side figure here. This is basically a planar device, right? Planar device means you have a source here, you have a drain here, and a channel is, if you put a gate, a channel is formed here and the current flows from source to drain. Okay, this is the current flow, correct? This is what you have learned till now. Please understand this is a planar structure, which means that the gate is sort of embedded within the drain and source region and because of which there will be a flow of charge carriers from source to drain and so on and so forth. Then you have this shallow trench isolation STI. This is referred to as shallow shallow trench isolation, right? Now this is this this is done in order to electrically insulate one device from another. So you will you will have another device somewhere here. You will have another device somewhere here. So there will be an STI here, and there's already STI here. So they electrically insulate the devices. This is the bulk MOSFET. We have been knowing it for last 30, 40, 50 years, and so on and so forth. Then came FinFET, uh, which was known to us somewhere around 26, 2006, five or six, it first came into picture. Commercially, it became viable in 2010, 2012, and then it was used in Intel's uh, chip uh, around 2014, 2015, right? So it's a pretty mature technology, but uh, reliability is also better and the yield is also very good. Uh, let's look how is it different from a planar technology. The difference is that it's basically a non-planar. First of all, it's non-planar. You see, it is non-planar in nature. Why is it non-planar? It is raised, first of all. So you see the gate, which is the red color, right? And you have the source on this side, and you have drain on the back side. And so there are three, three basically, fins available to you. And there's a single gate. And the gate surrounds this, 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 all the three. Which means now the gate has a, be has a better control on all the sides of the device. And therefore, your second order effects uh, will be, uh, your short channel effects will be relatively very, very low. Right? Why? Because now the gate has a much better control over the channel. Right? Now, this N plus drain, and we have an N plus source. So, you, you, where will you apply the bias? On the drain side. Source is generally grounded. If you apply a positive bias, and if you apply a positive gate voltage moves in the threshold voltage of the device, then an inversion layer will be formed just below the gate. And once you apply a drain bias, a current will flow. However, please understand, this is quasi-planar, right? Or it is slightly above the plane. And it's a three-dimensional effect which you see here. Now, this has got an advantage also. It has got a disadvantage also. What is the advantage? Advantage is since the gate has now control over all the, uh, all the, over the channel fully, uh, your second order, as I told you, will be low. So there will be very low threshold voltage roll-off, very low dibble effect. There will be almost no GIDL effects, and so on and so forth. But the and the current will also be very high because you're using three. So you see why is it known as a FinFET? Because if you look at this diagram here, this is the red colored is your gate, right? And and these are almost like fins of the fish. This this this. And that's the reason it is known as a fin, uh, uh, FinFET. So it was actually done by a Japanese scientist uh, initially, I'm forgetting his name, and then it was actually uh, uh, popularized uh, by uh, Professor Chengming Hu from UC Berkeley, 
who gave this name as fin he and uh, the, the, the japanese uh, japanese scientist who gave this name and he they were able to give this concept of this fin fit which is basically non quasi planar so the current also increases but the cost you pay for it is since these are raised structures you see you will have a problem here uh, since these are raised what happens is the gate starts to talk uh, the gate starts to talk with the channel here and this also this side so there is a capacitance there is so between this and this there will be a capacitance between uh, this and this you will have a capacitance between this and this you will have a capacitance and so on and so on. so there are multiple parasitic capacitances which will come up and therefore they will actually tend to reduce the frequency of operation of this fin fit and that's the major problem of a fin fit being a non non planar device okay so i have a p well structure and of course an sti the same goes for the lower curve here and this is basically your p type mosfet and you have this p p mos uh, in form of fin fits available to you okay how do you how do you actually uh, design this is this is slightly uh, a basic idea of 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 designing with fin fits of course uh, it has got a much larger drive current uh, for a given layout or a footprint as compared to its corresponding bulk mosfet area so which means that if you have a bulk mosfet the bulk mosfet the current carrying capability will be relatively smaller as compared to that of fin fit right uh, let's explain to you what is the meaning of quantized channel width so you see so you see that in this case uh, here uh, you have these uh, uh so there are effectively how many channels there are three channels right right and therefore if each channel carries a current of say x milliamp right x x uh, milliamp then the three uh, then, then three of them will carry approximately 3x and if there were five number of channels it will carry 5x so on and so forth so it's an integer multiple of the number of channels which you have correct that is what you get from this uh, uh, from this uh, uh, difference so therefore if somebody tells you no i want a current which is between x and 3x right or between x and 2x then you are in a problem this is known as quantization of the width the width is quantized right and you can have either therefore so if you have 1 milliampere current it will be 3 milliampere it will be 5 milliampere you can't have a 3.5 or 3.75 milliamp current available to you this uh, is your what is known as the quantized channel width this is first thing the second thing is how do you define maybe i i do have a slide here uh i i do have a yes so you see uh, the effective width of a fin fit as compared to a bulk mosfet is actually equals to 2h fin plus w fin i will explain to you what does it mean right i'll explain to you what does it mean and and maybe i'll give you an idea about what so let's suppose i have a fin fit uh, let's see let i will what, what i will do is i will just try to uh, try to magnify this part and show it to you and then explain to you what i have been discussing now so it is something like this if you do a cross section and consider that on the back side is a source on the and on the back side of your computer screen is the drain then we define this as the fin here this is the fin here where, where this is this is your w fin right and this is your height of the fin so fin has a width and it has a height so if you want to look at the total w it is nothing but this plus this plus this which means that it is basically two times h fin plus w fin this is the total width of the device now i told you earlier that id was proportional to w by l now what you have done incidentally is by l is going on going on reducing because of moore's law 
but w is also increasing in this case as compared to a bulk mosfet and the reason is by simply making this h fin larger and larger which means that if the height of the fin is larger then i automatically get this value to be large and therefore my current to be large right and 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 that's the reason we say that effective current right is much larger in case of a fin fed as compared to a bulk mosfet now now the the problem with quantized channel widths are that you can only have currents in certain steps right and therefore it becomes a problem for designing logic and memory however for analog uh, you don't have to worry too much about it because you're looking into in analog you're looking basically into transconductance which is nothing but del id del vgs right rate of change of drain current with respect to gate voltage right that is your gm higher the value better will be your voltage gain in an analog design because this is equals to gm times r out r out is the output impedance so if you want your gm to be very very high right you can actually make the current to be very sensitive to variations in the value of the gate voltage and that is possible in fin fed because the in the fin fed the gate is surrounding the channel from all possible directions further it has got less dibble fin fed has got less dibble and it has got a better output impedance and therefore approximately three times the intrinsic gain and therefore fin feds have found actually a very good use in bulk in 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 analog and mixed signal applications as well uh further uh, there is no body effect for fin feds but, but one problem which i already discussed with you earlier that it has a problem of a higher resistance and the reason is that since it's a three dimensional effect effectively if you look at the source contact and the drain contact here there will be a resistance which will be here and this will go up to the gate side right this is known as the spreading resistance higher the value lower will be the uh, higher the value higher will be the value of tau because tau if you remember from your basic network theory course is equals to r into c so if your r is relatively large then r into c is also large tau is also very large tau large means you can't operate at very high frequency your ft and ft max will be relatively small that is the disadvantage when you have these fin feds coming into picture uh this is one thing the second thing is uh, that uh, your your there is a mismatch in in, in your process uh, in case of fin feds because these are very very small Uh, dimension devices and i would expect to see a very large change in its output characteristics by small change in the uh, fin fed process technology and there are mismatches already available in current fin fed technology which does not allow it to robust manner when we put it into uh, digital applications okay uh, so th this is the fin fed uh, which i was talking about and um, uh, we had developed this in our lab when i said developed i don't mean to say we have fabricated it it is beyond uh, in india you cannot do it uh, in 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 tsmc and imec belgium and gf possibly you will be able to do this trigate fin fed design uh, this uh, what you see here this one is your silicon which is basically let us suppose this is a source right and this orange one is your oxide layer and the gate is basically the red one now if i simply make this oxide thickness large then the then the gate loses control over the top of the channel there is there will be obviously channel at the this side and at the back side but the gate will lose control over the top of the channel and therefore a gate all around device converts into a double gate mosfet right double gate why because this is one gate and the back side is another gate right Uh, to 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 explain to you we see that this is a typical structure which people simulate for most practical purposes where you have the source contacts where you have this drain contacts right and you have this height of the fin this is the height of the fin which you see right i think bravo ah try it is more plain surface to come right so i have the source contact i have this drain contact here and uh, and uh, these contacts uh, will have obviously 
uh, multiple. So there are, this is basically a three fin, uh, three fin structure which I'm showing here. And this is basically through synopsis tool set which we are using. Okay, uh, let's come to the layout of the planar MOSFET and FinFET. And this is where uh, we interact with the fabricators when we fabricate this FinFET. <clears throat> and we say that the total width is basically this, if you look very carefully, this one is the effective width of a single fin. And then you multiply with the total number of fins and then you multiply with the total number of fingers. Understand this point. Uh, if you look at this array here, you have got two channels, one channel, two channel, right? Obviously there will be three channel, four channel, and there are two gates. One is this gate, another is this gate. So effectively four devices are formed. One, two, three, four. Wherever my channel, channel sort of intersects uh, with the gate, I will obviously have a device, active device being formed. We already know this point, right? So what we do here is the total width of the device is width of a single fin multiplied by the number of fin, fins multiplied by total number of fingers. Uh, fingers means basically this, one, two, three, four, right? And there will be four effective W will be there, right? Uh, uh, we define the pitch, uh, fin pitch, as the distance between two uh, fin of a fin fet, right? The distance between two fin fet is defined as my fin pitch. And it has been seen and experimentally determined, so determined also that the fin pitch should be approximately equals to twice of height of the fin. So if your height of the fin is around 20 nanometer, then my pin pitch uh, should be approximately equals to 40 nanometer. This is what we uh, what what the people have done over a period of time further if the gate length is fixed you're not changing the gate length then if this ratio of w fin by h fin if it increases right uh, then this leads to a degradation of the gate control which means that as w fin by h fin ratio becomes larger and larger uh, the gate starts to lose control over the channel and you and you inadvertently let uh, the device enter into steep saturation uh, or into uh, uh, de degraded means you don't let it uh, all second order effects will come into picture let's look at the layout of a fin fit this top one is basically the layout of my fin fit and the bottom one is the layout of my mosfet as you can see in the top one, we have these drain and source available. And there are these channels being formed and there's a single gate here. Similarly channel here and there's a single gate here, right? So we have two gates and there are about 12 channels in, the, in this case, right? And therefore, uh, if you know the current approximately for each one of the channels, you can just multiply this by 12 to get that overall gate. Though it is not that simple, but on a rough back of the envelope, uh, you will get such type of design. Uh, this is a work which we did at our labs. And we saw that uh, uh, when you draw a fin fit, you all, all always have these resistances occurring for you. And these are known as horizontal resistances and vertical resistances, right? And this is your, uh, this is your source drain. Uh, this is your uh, spacer width which you see, the distance between the source drain and the fin, right? And the difference between the two fins, which is this one, is defined as my S fin. Or the distance between the two fins is defined as H fin. H fin is the height of the fin, which you see, right? And W fin is this width of the fin. What we saw was that as the number of fin increases, suddenly for two numbers of fins, the gate resistance fell down drastically. And then as the number of fins increased, uh, there was an increase in the gate resistance, right? And uh, we were not very sure why this reduction in the uh, gate resistance took place uh, at the first place when we moved from single fin to uh, second fin. Possibly it has to do with the fact that the resistance which was earlier in series have now become in parallel. So the first, once you put two fins, at least one of them is in parallel, which makes the overall resistance of the gate go down. But then when you go on adding fins, when you go on adding fins, 
uh, the gate resistance starts to rise once again from a low value to a high value, right? And this was the overall uh, gate resistance variation with number of fins which we saw, right? And this is uh, is the is the takeaway from this slide. Uh, we also then predicted the value of gain versus frequency, and uh, we saw that um, uh, it's we were reaching the for the for the device which we have stated, uh, we got a maximum frequency of 625 gigahertz and the transit frequency was 427 gigahertz right and this was for both we had taken the pin pitch uh, uh, as 40 nanometers and height of the pin to be approximately equals to uh, 42 nanometers right let me uh, end my talk uh, by uh, by discussing with you maybe one small uh, invention which has already come up and uh, it, is, it, is, it was released by Samsung uh, for its memory application, and that is the nanosheet uh, FET revolution, right? In nanosheet, what you do is you break the whole channel into multiple sheets. And as you can see, this is sheet number one, this is sheet number two, and this is sheet number three. So let us suppose sheet number one, sheet number two, and this is sheet number three. So there are three sheets, and this is known as a single stack one stack in, within one stack you have three sheets available right sheet one sheet two sheet three and these sheets are by themselves small channels and you, you will have source and drains the source may be away from you uh, away from you and the drain will be nearer to you and therefore if you apply a drain bias a current will flow which means that now the gate is surrounding the sheet from all the four directions please understand and that's the basic difference between a nano sheet and a fin fit in a fin fit you are surrounding by three directions here you are actually surrounding by four directions and therefore better control better reliability and larger on current and a very very low off current because your leakages are small and that's what you see an advantage here your leakage currents are relatively very small right you see your leakage is very small but your on currents are relatively high so this ratio of ion by IOF, which is one of the important parameters, is actually very large, right? For the nano sheet as compared to uh, uh, even a fin fit of the same uh, value. Uh, so uh, just to give you a movement of the device technology from 130 down up to two to three nanometers, uh, at those nodes at 180, 130, 90, you did have uh, people worked with strained silicon germanium, right? And this was meant to increase the mobility for a larger on current. Uh, subsequently, in around 45, 32, people worked with high K material uh, dielectric so that you are able to control the channel much better. Then you went for FinFET where the gate was surrounding from at least the three directions. Then you finally ended up in nano sheet where the sheet was surrounded by the gate in all the four directions. So if you look very carefully at this edge here, this is my gate. This is the sheet here. This is the sheet. And just above the sheet, uh, what you see here is the oxide layer, which you see. This is the oxide layer. So it's actually a MOS device, but it's a non, uh, non, uh, it's a planar, non planar MOS device. And therefore, you apply a bias here. And when the bias voltage is larger than the threshold voltage of these nano sheets, you have the channel being formed. Once you apply a drain bias, there will be a flow of current. This is my STI, shallow trend, shallow trend isolation, to separate two devices and to make my leakage current as small as possible. OK. Uh, so I will just uh, uh, show you one slide before I stop. And this is what we have done at our uh, research group. And this was done by uh, where you calibrate with TCAD for a particular nano sheet structure. And the calibration was very good for a channel length of approximately 12 nanometer. And uh, we got a much a lower value of, much better value of output in this case as compared to the uh, overall system. Uh, similarly, uh, we saw that, uh, we saw uh, also that once we were able to uh, 
uh, and this is what an optimization we do in NanoSheet is uh, in the spacer we introduced high key dielectric, right? Right, and 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 that helps to improve the current, right? And as you can see, when my spacer length high key dielectric is fully around the spacer, your current is slightly larger as compared to the black one when you don't have any high key dielectric available. Your your trans uh, your transconductance is much lower. Which means that for an analog application, it's better idea to have the whole of the spacer length devoted for uh, high K material, right? Similarly, if you look at the right hand side, I can see current versus gate voltage. And here also with high LHK, I get a much higher current as compared to that of LHK, LHK is equals to zero. Uh, I will just stop here maybe, and then uh, uh, I'll not go into further details of it. I will stop here at this stage, and uh, 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 we will and and we I'll just show you some important properties of nano sheets which we have found out that if you have three stack layer, then the peak value of GM and ID is obtained at approximately LHK equals to half, which means that the if half of the spacer length is filled up with high key dielectric, I will have the best value of GM by ID, and but for but when you fill up the whole of the spacer with high key dielectric, which is HFO2. Uh, then the variations are very, very minimal, right? And with this, let me stop my presentation and uh, uh, let me recapitulate what we did. Uh, so I talked to you about Moore's law and the implications of Moore's law in device as well as in switching energy. Then we discussed with you about the MOSFETs, uh, bulk MOSFET technology and how the capacitance are there. And then we went to a quasi-planar device, which is FinFET, which basically gives you an idea about uh, how the quasi-planar structure adds capacitance and therefore uh, bad for uh, very high frequency. And therefore, the more the motivation is that using FinFET or nano sheets, can you design a high frequency circuit, right? And that's the reason we went into nano sheets. And in the nano sheet, we'd explain to you that what are the optimized value of your uh, dielectric spacer so that the best results can be obtained in terms of GM by ID, right? So with this, let me stop. Uh, and uh, if you want to have any questions, please let me know. I, I will be happy to answer those questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we'll be reading questions on behalf of participants. So the first question is by Neha Kapila. What particular material is used as nano sheet? So uh, we still use silicon. Uh, that's very straightforward and simple. We still use silicon for uh, for uh, for nano sheet, but there are uh, but there are uh, advantages of using 2D material also. So you do have now interventions from uh, WS2 uh, like uh, tungsten tungsten sulfide, molybdenum sulfide. Uh, using that technology also, people are trying to develop uh, these nano sheets. But please understand, uh, 2D materials are still a long way to go in terms of having. Uh, uh, reliability and stability. Therefore, as of today, we still talk with silicon only. So silicon uh, is the mainstay. Second question is from Professor Sumit Saha. What are the current challenges in nano sheet fates that need further attention? Can we use 2D material as channel in nano sheet fates in silicon process? Uh, yes, Professor Saha, actually, uh, I just now answer the previous question with the same background that there are a group of people who are trying to replace silicon by 2D materials. But the problem with 2D materials is currently its yield and its, uh, uh, and its uh, reliability in terms of uh, process variations. So that's the bottom. Prefer at this stage. 2D material, it is still a research stage. In 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 industry, we still prefer silicon uh, to be the main step. As far as other uh, challenges are concerned, one major challenge uh, is is actually uh, stabilization of the stack, right? Uh, and th which means that you cannot go beyond a certain number of stacks, and within the stack, you cannot go beyond a certain number of sheets. And people are looking uh, because between sheet sheet to sheet uh, there has to be a minimum distance which you need to ascertain right and that limits the height of your stack 
and that limits the overall current so these are the few technologically challenges which you people face apart from growing a very well defined sheet with proper cornering of the a sheet that's a major issue this question is where we can do this sort of research in india experimentally uh, experimentally uh research in india yes sir experimentally this sort of fab, research fab. we can do yeah. yes you mean to say fab right fabrication yes yes sir right so uh, we don't have any facility in india very frankly uh, we did have one in semiconductor scl in 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 uh, in chandigarh but that's a legacy node of 180 nanometer right it is still good for many of the issues we can still work with 180 nanometer for student purposes and everything else but we cannot do uh, in india uh, unfortunately at this stage uh, uh, we cannot do it but with this uh, nanoelectronics user program as well as india semiconductor mission coming up uh, in all probability we will get some idea but surely we will not be having nano sheets being developed in india you still have a long way to go we still have a long way to go uh, but if you want to work you can work in imec belgium imec belgium does have a nano sheet fabrication process uh, i am not very sure tsmc also has a, uh, a has a nano sheet fabrication process yes sir the next question is uh, which parameter is easier to measure fin fit by a fin fit potential current or transconductance uh, i don't know uh, uh, i couldn't get can you repeat repeat this? yes sir so which parameter is easier to measure by a fin fit potential current or transconductance current current is the most easiest to measure you apply a drain bias Uh, put an put a simple ammeter in the top, and you can actually measure the current. Transconductance is basically del I D del V G. So you require to have a a, a, vector, a network analyzer machine in order to generate G M. So I D is the most easiest one to do. What are the good open source spice spice simulators for the fin fit? Uh, open source. Uh, open source uh, we do have t spice right we uh, t t spice many people use but i am not very sure whether fin fetch process uh, pdks can be insert uh, like you require to have this pdks right i don't know how many of you are aware of but you require to have this process design kits for fin fetch available to you so if you are working today with a 32 nanometer or even a, a 10 nanometer fin fetch its pdk should be available so uh, uh, and therefore you have to enter an mou with any of the global foundries or samsung in order to get those pdk and you can use it for non commercial purposes uh, another good way of doing it is please go ahead and do a verilog a modulation so try to formulate a device modeling through tcat synopsis silvaco then go for a verilog a through matlab and then you can go for circuit simulation in cadence platform next question is uh, can we use the finfet in threshold inverter quantizer for implementing flash adc you can off anywhere anywhere where where there is a requirement of fet uh, you can use finfet there as well the only problem with the quantizer will be to the best of my knowledge that's not my expert uh, domain uh, the problem there will be because finfet will is a quasi planar in structure it will have a much larger capacitance uh, uh, effect and therefore the capacitance will also vary with process technology change so i am not very sure whether it will be good idea to actually use finfet in adc we still use bulk mosfets they work very fine with adc so i don't see an added advantage of just using a finfet for adc purposes thank you very much sir thank okay. you sir sir i have a question sir excuse me sir i have a question please please go ahead yes please uh, sir in your sl uh, slide 18 uh, you have uh, given some design parameters for your design sir right. what is the sti you have uh, uh, used in that 
okay uh, what sti have i used yes sir what is the uh, right the space uh, no, no. How much? right no no so uh, for this case uh, for the, for this uh, for this particular project we were not using multiple finfects we were using a single finfect right so we were assuming that uh, you have a standalone finfect and you don't have any other finfect in the nearby and there Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. So the next question is: Is carbon nitride a good two D material for this? Carbon nitride. Yes, sir. Carbon nitride. I am not so sure. I cannot answer this question because it is uh, uh, like you. You still use WS two and MOS two. that are two standard heterogeneous 2d material which people still use i am not very sure about carbon nitride carbon nitrides to the best of my knowledge are used for power devices where for example gallium nitride right uh, the, your your carbon nitride these are used for high power devices where the current flow is very very large and you require 400 to 500 watts of power to be dissipated i think that is a good idea to work with in my view so thank you sir so last question is from where we get pdk for cadence virtuoso okay virtuoso like that virtuoso cadence cadence virtuoso yes yes so sir. yes yes so pdks are actually your uh, process design kits uh, which you have and uh, these kits are actually used as physics based which come from fabricated to us cadence then takes this pdk inserts into its own eda tool sets and we use it but the idea here is uh, to get the ptk you need to sign an mou with uh, there are certain gpdks general process design kits those are you can offload it, uh, download it from the internet but if you want a very specific ptk you need to sign an mou with that particular company and that ptk will be given to you with the condition that you will be only using it for academic purposes and not for commercial purposes right so your institute has to sign an mou with that company in order to get that pdk uh, uh, the there are business questions only and thank you for okay thanks thank a lot you. thank you very much yes sir thank you thanks a lot now we'll move to the next speaker so we have reached the last session of the of the sir the topic of the tutorial is 3d finfet simulation using silvaco tcat which will which will be delivered by dr purvasa dr purvasa obtained her masters in vlsi design from anna university tamil nadu in 2014 and phd in electronics engineering with specialization in nano electronics from velod institute of technology chennai tamil nadu currently working as lead tcat application engineer at cognitive Design Technology Private Limited, Bangalore, India. Her research interests lie in the development of novel material-based semiconductor devices. She has a vast experience in nanoscale transistor, micro, and nano electronics. Silvago Ticket software develops a new semiconductor process and devices that dramatically reduce cost and time to market. Silvago device simulator can execute physics. physics based uh, device simulations to predict and understand the device performances in this session we look at how some of the features of this should improve the efficiency of the design flow of 3d finfet devices with this brief introduction i would kindly request dr purvasa to throw light on the topic ma'am please share your slides yeah very good evening to you all and thank you so much for the wonderful introduction i hope i'm audible yes sir you are yes ma'am sounds great one quick second let me share my window okay so how about my window is it visible 
Yes, Purusha. Okay. Thank Please you. Please make it full screen. Yeah, yeah, I'll make it full screen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, welcome back, everyone. So I think this is the third day we are discussing about Silvaco tools. And in today's session, we'll be discussing about 3D FinFET simulation using Silvaco TCAT. Myself, Dr. Puvasha Shannadan, lead TCAT application engineer from Cognitive Design Technology, Private Limited, Bangalore, in association with Silvaco. So without any delay, let us start with the session. So outline, so we'll have a quick introduction. I guess like a uh, few would have definitely undergone the past two days uh, overview as well as uh, plasmonic solar cell uh, demo as well. And maybe a few would be joining today, so just for them. And then we'll be discussing about the TCAT design flow and followed with a quick introduction with the uh, uh, victory suit, followed with the FinFET applications. And then we'll discuss about the FinFET simulation. We'll go for a live demo. And finally, we'll conclude with a summary. Okay. So as an introduction, so it's quite known, Silvaco TCAD has been used tire run power device manufacturers and designers for decades. So under Victory Suit, we have Victory Process, Victory Mesh, and Victory Device, which are going to be a set of tools that provide the functionality and flexibility, which meet the needs of the designers. So here in this case, the changes in process can be like easily understood and which helps us in maximizing the device performance and increasing the manufacturing yield. Of course, we take into consideration about the minimizing of the engineering cycles and cycle time. And then we have Victory Mesh, which is like which provides the users with a power functionality to mesh and redefine, that is refine the existing structure of either a 2D or a 3D TCAT structures. And another good feature of Victory Mesh is about a solid modeling capabilities, which we'll be discussing a little later. And then we have Victory Devices, a complete device simulator, which can execute the physics-based device simulations in order to predict and understand device performance. Okay, with this quick interaction, let us jump to the uh, TCAD design flow. So this is how the flow is gonna be. So initially a user come up with a layout design and it's not mandatory, of course it's not mandatory, but in case if a, if a user is having a layout design and they want to incorporate into the process simulator and undergo various process steps. So process step is something similar like what you carry out in your uh, uh, experimental fab labs. Um, so here, because TCAD is a tool which is going to mimic all our fabrication steps. So from that perspective, a user will incorporate the layout into the process simulator, uh, where he or she will be having the flexibility of undergoing various process steps, um, maybe an implantation, diffusion, deposition, so many oxidation, so many process steps. Once after that, the structure is being designed, the next step immediately, it will be about the characterization of the tool, that is the device what we have generated. So from victory process, either we can jump to the device simulator, that is victory device, where we can characterize our device by just properly fitting the perfect physics models, giving the proper contact, and then providing with the, uh, that is ramping the biasing conditions, all these and all. So everything will be taken care of under device simulation. And another parameter that I would like to, I mean, like a, a tool that I would like to specify here is from the victory process, you can take the output and fed it as an input to a 3D RC extraction, which is going to be the tool called Clever, which is available with Silvaco. So, but in today's session, we will be discussing about this flow, that is layout to victory process and victory process to victory device. So this is what we are going to understand with a quick, small demo. Okay. So uh, victory TCAT suit. So I think I have no doubt like everyone, uh, at least by this time, after attending the past two days uh, sessions of Silvaco, uh, to some extent you would have got a knowledge about what is victory process, what it will be doing it. And this is for the participants who have joined for the day. Okay, TCAT process simulation is, is, is gonna be crucial to develop a new technology. 
as well as to maintain an existing semiconductor processes. So virtualizing the uh, manufacturing process would allow the uh, organization in order to maintain like a, a digital twin of their semiconductor process. So changes in process can be, as I mentioned earlier, it can be well understood, it can increase the device performance. So as mentioned earlier, victory process is a general purpose process simulator tool. One good advantage about victory processes, if a user would also like to analyze the stress and strain in their device. Yes, any question? Shall I continue? Oh, please. Okay. Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, so while you consider victory process, it uh, apart from uh, performing all the process simulation steps, the Silvaco victory process tool will allow the user to analyze the stress in the device, which along with the stress and strain effect which they have applied to the device, they can easily integrate to the device simulator and see the impact of the stress and the strain analysis in there device what they have analyzed. Okay, so this is a, just a quick uh, overview of what is victory process. Um, so this you could see I have just given you a rough idea to give you a quick snapshot on what are the possibilities it is it can perform. So from this perspective, um, like this just showing you a Monte Carlo ion implantation, and that is with a highly non-planar geometry structure. And then here you could see about the distribution, boron distribution, uh, for after that is undergoing uh, analytical implant and Fermi diffusion. And then this is, we could see the structure with this without stress. And then we can see the structure after the inclusion of stress, that is stress dependent oxidation. So just to give you a, a quick idea of what is happening here, because oxidation can be simulated either in an embryical format or full physical or even in hybrid mode. So embryical mode is like um, we can say it can be applied for a thin oxidation layers, whereas when we consider a full physical mode, it can it has a capability. The tool victory process has the capability of simulating the oxidant transport and of course the reaction on the silicon and the silicon dioxide interface that is uh, semiconductor and uh, into the interface and uh, which allows for the material deformation and stress formations, etc. Automatic switching would be that. So that's a good feature about victory process. So automatic switching between the empirical and the full physical mode will be depending on the oxide thickness here. Okay, so the next is uh, we have, I mean, like I've given you a quick example on uh, the etching also, like uh, fast geometrical etching models for structure prototyping is supported by uh, BP, that is victory process of Silvaco. And uh, of course, it also allows for the physical ideal bed etching, uh, where we consider with the isotrophic and anisotropic etching characteristics. Uh, so many other, that is, uh, uh, it can undergo for like the physical etching of a complex multi-material structure with a selectivity is also possible by means of using uh, victory process uh, of Silvaco too. Okay, so what we will do now so these i told like an implantation i've given you an, a, a just a quick snapshot of all these uh, oxidation etching deposition and all now we'll try to relate with our code what we are going to discuss that is in the demo i guess everyone would have received the code the finfert code <coughs> so you can just open it in your deck build okay and make sure the dot input that is dot in file is the input deck code. And I think I have provided you with a dot LAY, uh, I mean, another one file, which is the layout file. So if you remember, I would have told from the layout, we can incorporate to the VP, that is victory process, where then we can perform various uh, processation steps to finally obtain the pinfet structure, right? So this that's, uh, procedure is what we are going to see. Okay. Without any delay, we will just correlate with what we have seen in the slide and what is happening in the code. Okay, so to run or uh, to start the victory process, it's a framework, right? So we start with go victory process, and then we'll be starting with the initial, 
okay so initial what does it initial will do okay so we are going to uh, that is initial uh, we need to perform with respect to the material we need to provide and in our case we already have a layout we have, which we have designed for example if you take silvaco we would have definitely designed it by means of using uh, the mask views so i'll come to that i'll show i'll open and show you what is this layout file how to view this what is there inside that layout file i'll definitely show you so uh, this uh, what is happening here means we are calling that layout file and then we are defining with respect to the uh, that is depth and uh, gas height okay now comes a question okay what are all the inputs that has been supported by vp means one is about the deck input that is the description of the process flow that's this all this code we have right that's what we call it as deck input or input deck so which should consist of all the processing conditions and it should be consisting of the specific model parameters and the flow of the specific model so we not worry we'll be discussing one by one what is there in the code step by step then optional i told it's not mandatory right so input deck is mandatory whereas the one which is optional is the layout so if a user has a, a like a predefined uh, predefined or pre created layout they can just obviously include it in vp directly or from the scratch they can perform the fabrications or, or the process steps in vp directly and now what are the extension that is supported by vp with respect to layout means vitri process supports with dot lay that is dot layout um, feature another one extension is dot gds so in either format you can directly incorporate so there's no need of any conversion all these and all you can directly incorporate either dot lay or dot gds file into the vp okay so <coughs> this is all about um, the input for the victory process and of course along with that we have open model files uh, then open material database uh, because there is nothing but it consists of the collection of material properties and modeling parameters for all the materials uh, that is available as a default in silvaco library okay so this is just a quick uh, understand about now we will discuss about the output later so first we'll go step by step okay great so as i mentioned to start a simulation we need a structure right so the first statement which uh, it should be like it should be the one which provides a structure correct right? so from that perspective we use this initial statement over here followed with the material for that particular uh, i mean like the structure the general structure okay so because it it creates a, a, a planar structure right and then uh, uh, after this what happens is we are providing with the material and we are incorporating the layout design over here then after that we are designing or we are providing the depth as well as we are providing the gas height so what does this means to specify a simulation domain we need to provide the depth parameter as well as the gas height parameter that is the depth of the substrate material so that's what how because we told it's going to be silicon but how far it is going to be the depth means it's of 0.45 um that is by default in ticket we have everything in micrometers microns levels okay so if it is 0.45 it means that it is 0.45 microns okay then after uh, defining the depth of the substrate material the next parameter that we need to define is about the height of the gas above the substrate so that can be performed or uh, uh, defined by means of using gas height over here okay so this is the like it, see uh, when you take a tcat uh, code scripting it should be in a proper flow okay so considering this the first step that we need to perform is about creating a substrate which is of having so and so depth and uh, the gas height of it then the next predominant step is about okay so this is a 3d uh, structure right so victory process has a capability of the, uh, designing a 2d and a 3d structure now in our case it is spin fit so we are going to define that is design a 3d uh, structure so from that perspective we will be considering x axis then we will be considering y axis and then we will be considering the 
z axis all three axes will be taken into consideration so this uh, need not worry this is about the syntax for defining the mesh so line that is in x axis it has to start at the location 0 and this will be available till the location of 0.15 and as i mentioned earlier everything is by default to be taken into consideration in terms of micron level okay then y direction also similarly which position it has to the structure has to start and which position it has to end in the y direction similarly z direction also need to be defined okay so after providing the uh, meshing conditions so uh, honestly speaking here we will be creating a structure in vp okay next step what we will be doing is we will be introducing that is see when we simulate something we need to make sure the device performance is good but it is how far this mesh plays a vital role so for that silvaco has like for that because it's going to be a very very important and significant fa factor which is going to have a greater impact on our device performance so considering that uh, silvaco provides with a tool called that is a framework called victory mesh so completely for understanding the mesh and that to making it more efficient and more accuracy as well we'll discuss that a little later right now we will make sure that we have defined all the three directions of the mesh in both uh, sorry in all the three that is x y and z next step we are creating a fin obviously fin fit so we are going to create a fin so when you consider over here there are several steps as you could see here that is we are going to perform um, the geometrical etching over here. Obviously, Silvaco supports not only with geometrical etching, it also supports for the uh, physical etching as well. And of course, physical deposition, geometrical deposition, both are possible. But in our case, in FinFET, this example, we are going to understand about the geometrical etching as well as the deposition of the so on so material. Okay. Now, understanding this consider this case, so H, we are going to perform a geometrical etching. So the syntax behind it is going to be H, perfect. The next one is what, what we are going to etch, which material we are going to match, which means you are going to be selective at this case. There are two cases. Uh, you can be selective and at times you can be non-selective. That is, you can decide which part of the structure that you would like to etch. That is, which part means which material that you would like to etch. So in that case, it comes under the category of selective etch. And another is like you are going to etch this, that is, you're going to simulate this geometrical etching line for the device okay you're not you're not specific you're not selecting at which material this has to perform so that comes under the category of non-selecting uh that is non-selection etching okay now in our case we are going to etch the material which is of silicon and you could have the like uh, you could see there are i've used uh, different um, that is thickness I've used, angle I've used, and then I also include a line called mask, which is equivalent to active, and then I've used a call min. What are all these? That's what we are going to discuss. That is, here in this case, I'll come, I'll come in this way. So when you take min, min is a model for the edge, geometrical edge that is taking place in VP. Okay, so that might be the question. Okay, is it the only model? Definitely no. There are several models like min model is there, max model is there, wet model, wet edge model is there, dry edge model is there. So I'll give you a rough idea how this is gonna be. One quick second. <coughs> Sorry, excuses. Okay, so let me just go to the uh, manual. This is, we are going to understand about the job because we are going to discuss about the uh, geometrical models for etching. I hope it's quite visible to everyone. Okay, so now I'll quickly go on with the picture. So don't get confused about what is the cell mode, process mode and all, okay? So basically I'll give you a quick idea. What is the cell mode? What is this process mode? Okay, so in VP, you know, generally we uh, segregate this as a cell mode and uh, process mode. So in cell mode, what happens? You can define the structure that it is represented explicitly on an unstructured mesh. So that is, it will be consisting of a tetrahedral uh, with a unique material. Okay, whereas when you consider process mode, the structure is 
like I can say, it is a stack of material that you'll be sandwiching between the surfaces. Of, of course, one important thing that you will be undergoing the, uh, what to say, um, oxidation process, deposition process, all these, right? So the, uh, of course you have geometric operation, I do agree. But apart from this, you will be going for like uh, a physical base etching uh, or going for a deposition step. So when you consider those case, you cannot perform it using cell mode. So you'll be using it for uh, process mode. So the simulation, what we are going to perform, uh, you can stick on that we are going to see or focus only on process mode. Okay, before I do this, I, I would like to suggest everyone to click on this button. That is save and run because the simulation take little more time. So while we are discussing, let the simulation run at the behind, let us not disturb it, okay? So please run the simulation and then you can see the yellow one, which means at which line the simulation is running, it shows. And this is runtime output, which we can observe here, okay? So let it run before that. I'll give, uh, like you can right click and give scroll lock. So which, for, what does it mean? Means it will be running because every line it is keep on like moving on to the next line, right? Just to avoid confusion because we are going to discuss line by line. So please click, right click and then give scroll lock. Okay, that's it. It will do its job. Let us go and start uh, discussing about the points again. Okay, so we are going to focus on the process mode. Okay, fine. So this is how the mask view will be there. Okay, I will show you the layout file, what I've given you. I will definitely show you how to open it, how to visualize it, and what are the parameters present in it. But this is how you will be creating a mask from the scratch. So as I mentioned, there are several models. I just want to show you a quick difference. What is the difference between these models? Of course, uh, models, max model, minimum model. So you could see the structure. You please focus on the process mode. So this is the geometrical, uh, you have performed the geometrical etching selective that is for this particular material so you can see it's the material oxide with the max model for so and so thickness now similar way we can see non-selection that is you are not specifying which material you're going to etch so you could see the difference then you can observe the minimum model so see i can't show this there are so many things i can't put it in one single uh, code so i would like to just show you how the difference is going to be this when you see etch the material oxide with the thickness using max model and it is you need to call from the mask what you have included so this is for selective etching. This is for non-selective etching. Uh, that is, both the cases are here, but you are including your mask layer here. That is, you are uh, getting that uh, mask input over here. Similarly, you have for min model. So you could see the structure. This is process mode, and this is for selective min. And then uh, you could see again, uh, again, the selective min uh, thickness for, uh, uh, in this case. It is going to be, I'll quickly navigate to the point which I want to discuss. Yeah, this is what we are going to look in our code. That is, we are etching the material. In our case, it is silicon. We are using the model minimum and thickness as per your wish. And we are updating it from the mask which we have given as an input or we have incorporated into the VP. Coming back here. So this is what I was, uh, I was mentioning. So etch, material, silicon. Okay, and then you have the mask uh, that is from the mask you are activating that is using this active and then you are taking this minimum model and uh, thickness to what thickness you need it over here and which angle it should be applicable. So that's the reason you are specifying the angle also over here. Okay, so please don't uh, get confused with this. Okay, that is the uh, that is user has the flexibility to adjust the angle of the sidewall. Okay. Uh, so basically when you take, uh, by default, the side wall is perfectly vertical, correct? So that is, I can say it is 90 degree. So, but if you would like to adjust and see how the impact is going to be, you can include the angle parameter over here. That's it. This is about the geometrical etching. Okay. Then we have deposit. Okay. Next is geometrical deposition process. We are going to take same procedure, deposit oxide. With the thickness, you can see that it's just going to be in the surface. So that's why I'm giving the position as zero. Then 
we are using max model over here. So again, I'll show you the difference here. One quick second. Yeah, this is geometrical models for deposition, which also uh, is available for both cell mode and process mode. And uh, so you could see the max model here. Mm, this is deposit material oxide, and this is for process mode. And let me show along with the mask layer input. Yeah, this is the mask and you could see here. So when you include the mask, what happened to it from the selective perspective? Okay, then again, similar case, it has min model. And of course, for etching, you have wet etching, dry etching also. Maybe after this, because if I keep discussing all these, it will take much time. So maybe you have till this week time to access this, right? So please go through all these and just get some knowledge of what is this minimum, uh, min model, max model, wet and dry. Okay, perfect. The next case is, uh, we are going to call that is after uh, the etching and the deposition. The next is the statement that is mask. So this statement, it provides us, uh, I can say, a shortcut for a subset of the geometrical deposition operation. Okay, so basically it is used to cover the part of the surface with a protective coating, I can say. You can, you can think, remember in this way. Okay, and then, um, so you do, uh, the simplest form for it is going to be mask the statement, followed with what part in the uh, lay layout what we have designed that you need to include it over here. That is the mask name over here. Okay, then we will be having uh, the, <coughs> excuses. Again, we have the deposit where we are going to deposit the material silicon, which is having a thickness of 0 0.05 microns. And we are using the main model here. Uh, once after the session, you have the access as I mentioned till this week. So please try to run line by line and see the, uh, observe it in your structure. Because if I run line by line, Today, I don't think so we would be able to complete within the given span time. So please try to run line by line so you will understand what is happening to your structure. How this etching is taking place, how this deposition is taking place, uh, how what happened when you include the mask layer with your etching or uh, with your uh, deposition. Okay, so please try to li uh, run line by line and visualize it in your Tony plot. Tony plot is an interactive tool to visualize your uh, structure. And that is Tony plot 3D to visualize your 3D structure. And we have Tony plot to visualize your 2D structure as well as your plot. Okay, so please try to run line by line and you'll get idea what I'm talking about. Okay, so the next is, uh, it's about the strip, strip command. What is the strip command means? Again, it is gonna be a shortcut for selective etching of an exposed material. It is from the top of the structure. Okay, so basically it is used for I can say for removing the protective layer of mask, which is deposited with the mask statement, what we have done earlier, right? Okay, so that's about the strip. And um, uh, so this is like, uh, uh, this is just a creation of a fin. We are now done with the creation of the fin. Okay, now moving on with the creation of the gate structure, same procedure we are gonna follow. So we are depositing a material of oxynitrate with so and so thickness of uh, point. You can see it's of fine nano and then conformal. What is this conformal means? It's a model, okay? Conformal is a model which try to put the deposited material conformally on a, I can say on a, uh, non-planar surface, okay? And uh, of course, we use the thickness parameter to make sure that we determine the uh, offset, normal offset of the uh, new depositor surface from the input surface, that's it, okay? Uh, <coughs> obviously, the value if you are defining thickness, make sure it is uh, greater than zero here. Then we go for depositing HFO2 uh, with thickness and we are using the conformal model here. If you want to know more about the model, you can always check it in the, I mean, like the manual, you can go through it. Detail information will be there. And do not worry for all the models, what we are using, we make sure that we provide you with all physics equations properly, okay? So you can have a cross check. Then uh, we are going for depositing a polysilicon and we are using a max model over here. Then uh, again, we are going for etching that is we have deposited, right? So we are going to etch uh, some part of the polysilicon and uh, it is defined as poly in the mask layout. And for to it, we are going to etch uh, with uh, 0.1 uh, 
thickness and we are using max model here. Then uh, we have the electrode defined in the mask as electro, okay? And this is gonna be taking the material of polysilicon. That's about the creation of a gate structure. Okay, now uh, we have formed the fin, we have formed about the gate structure. So it is quite easy for us to complete the remaining structure following the same deposition and etch process over here for various thickness as per your requirements, okay? So please don't get confused with what is this SDH or not. All these details we have given in the layout. Let me quickly open and show you the uh, uh, layout so that you will get some idea. Okay, so let me just incorporate the file. <coughs> Excuses. Yeah, this layout. So let me open. You could see here. So active poly SDH electro, all these we have defined here, right? So that's that's what it's it is taking from the mask. Okay. And after you perform all these, no, finally we will be updating or uh, I can say that what are the process steps that we have carried so far? It will try to overwrite with our layout what we have initially included into the victory process okay so same here i use the uh, mass statement where i go for using this count which we see in the uh that is this is not the this is a name that we can create because see if you are generating a, a mask layout you can always use this mask view and create it right now we have already predefined that is pre-created so i'm just quickly showing you how it is going to be okay now then after all these uh, we will be undergoing again the strip and the deposition and then we are going for a doping of a polysilicon with so and so uh, um, dopants concentration of it to be uh, that is mentioned over here and then diffuse diffuse uh, in this case you could see we are performing the diffuse without oxidation so this statement runs an analyzing step right so it calculates the diffusion of the impurities and that is depending on the ambient okay so it may also oxidize the structure as well so the oxidizing ambient is only supported in the process mode so that is the reason i told previously itself if the user wish, they can obviously opt for cell mode or process mode. But if you are going for a proper process steps, then you need to decide in, like previously itself, whether you're gonna opt for either a cell or a process mode. So in our case, we are going to uh, use all these process steps. So we are performing the, we are using the process mode, I can say. Okay, again, the electrode mask, which is gonna have the material of polysilicon. Once it is done, I'm saving it with the name of FinFET VP0. And this is going to be the, o, that is a new layout that which consists of all the fabrication steps that we have performed earlier. Okay. So I make sure because see, if I don't use this uh, save condition and I don't create a new layout, it will override the existing one. But in my future case, if I want the previous one, so I can't go again and again, like, overwriting it and get it disturbed, right? So from that perspective, you can always save it as a different file, okay? So in our case, we are creating a new layout design, okay? Now this is all about victory process. So now I'm gonna discuss about victory mesh, right? Okay, so victory mesh, we'll go back to the slide and we'll come back later. So, so far we have created the fin structure, everything is done, okay? what is this victory mesh what it what are the capabilities it has that we will understand then we'll go to the code back okay <coughs> my apology okay i have a very bad throat today i'm sorry okay victory mesh for what purpose it is required means for the generation and for remeshing and then for solid modeling so for three things we can use this victory mesh that is freshly you can uh, generate the mesh using victory mesh or you can remesh that is remesh when it comes into category means already you have created a structure by means of using vp okay so after uh, updating this vp what happened that is a structure from vp you would like to uh, vary your mesh 
okay so from that perspective because see honestly speaking we we want we need to make sure that whatever the steps we are providing in process it try it has to or it, we need a better accuracy right only from that perspective we will be doing in the victory process so we will make sure that we do not disturb the machine what we are created in vp because and uh, according to vp the structure what we are creating should give us a greater accuracy but what happened at times it goes as a fine meshing at time oh, okay okay so when it goes as a fine meshing uh, what happened fine meshing is of course it will increase the accuracy of your device but at times we need to take care about the efficiency of the device as well okay so which means a coarse meshing should also be included in your structure this is the place where many one many faces they say conversion issue right Like we will be discussing that little later while we go for device simulator. So to avoid that, of course I agree. Accuracy, you focus on VP, that is victory process. But after that, we need to make sure that we go for a remeshing of the structure that we have created using uh, the VP in order to improve the efficiency of our device. From that perspective, we can use the remeshing technique that is available in victory. okay so which is victory mesh is a framework which has the capability of the generation and then remeshing and solid modeling i'll come to solid modeling later okay so uh, of course the re refined redefine can be performed for 2d structure and 3d structure of uh, that has been created using uh, uh, silvaco and good thing is about like you can you 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 can easily execute this in the deckbuild platform itself that's what we are going to see a little later okay so put on the formats that is accepted over here means silvaco standard structure format is accepted by victory mesh so which is consisting of dot str it's a standard format which is acceptable and easily in like integrate between our vp and vm that is victory mesh okay so this is all about a few words about victory mesh and i would like to mention something which is going to be little important over here because uh, there is like people use okay victory but uh, yeah, let me make it yeah so they use uh, that is victory mesh but they don't know what kind of uh, that is uh, in meshing itself what kind of they need to choose category so when you see here there are two things that is about delaunay and another is conformal mesh so i think you could see the difference by yourself when you consider delaunay mesh it supports that is it's for an unstructured sampling okay because we have this cartesian based sampling at times you may end up with your uh, that if you have a round corners all these and all so you need a proper meshing in those round corners obviously you need something unstructured so from that perspective this is unstructured sampling that is tetrahedral uh, meshing which is available in silvaco and which is also give you a very good accuracy and efficiency then we have cartesian based semi structured cartesian based sampling as well which comes under the category of conformal i guess you could see uh, the difference between both okay then uh, as i mentioned earlier device refinement that is remeshing so you can include a number of delaunay refinement schemes uh, either it is going to be general and tcat specific as well okay i don't i'll talk about the solid modeling technique okay so uh, see everyone we cannot say that everyone are process concerned person right few may be process concerned few may be device concerned okay what is this process concerned device concerned means few will be going to fabricate their device so in that case they have they want to optimize all the fabrication steps which they are going to do for experimentally using victory process create a structure remesh it in the victory mesh and then go for victory device for characterization but few what happen is they will be device concerned person that is they take the geometrical geometrical parameters of their device and they have a perfect uh, modeling for it uh, physics models for it perfect uh, like what to say um, they have optimized uh, uh, what to say work function conditions biasing conditions and all so those people comes under the category of device concern so from that perspective i'll discuss about this solid modeling 
So solid modeling, you cannot carry your process steps here, but it will give you a great feature for the device concerned person. That is, it contains a number of features to generate device, which is directly within this victory mesh engine itself. So a user, if they are, of course, we are going to discuss about 3D, right? So we need to make sure uh, about the circle, cylinder, ellipsoid, sphere, all these structures, right? And a few, and of course, I can even show you like the rounded corners, curved corners, all these need to be taken into consideration. So from that perspective, they can form this, uh, uh, what to say, um, trench type splicing, all these they can carry out using victory mesh, which comes under the category of the solid modeling techniques. Okay, so it makes our job so easy, but make sure that this does not involve any process steps. It's for device concerned people. Okay. This is what I want to show you people, like Delaunay machine, because uh, I was talking about the semi-cartesian based, semi-structured cartesian based and uh, unstructured, right? So you can see this is, and you consider the sample, uh, uh, I can say this is going to give you with the, uh, like uh, a basic <coughs> machine, then this provides you with the maximum element size, then we are going to discuss all this shortly. Okay, you could see this is the interface, right? So in the interface, if we want to refine, that is we want to go for a fine mesh, obviously. Obviously, uh, the interface, the high field and all, we need a, a fine meshing, okay? Uh, like uh, for example, like this is spin fit. Okay, that's great. For example, if you are working on tunnel fit, 3D structure, you know the tunneling region should be of fine mesh. So the place where you require uh, like the fine meshing, it, it, because that is the place which is going to give you a good band bending technique and will result you with the uh, perfect uh, accuracy, right? This is the reason I told. This is maximum element size. And this interface, we need to make sure it is fine mesh. And this is junction region, again, which is going to be of fine meshing. All these, like, simple commands. You, you can just interface the refinement, and then you can see the junction refinement, and this cut slice will let you know what is happening inside your device. See, one good feature I can say that is the most important significant feature of TCAD is that uh, like uh, you can see when you do experiment, you can understand what is happening with your device. But why it is happening, that, that still reminds us a question, right? So whereas TCAD, Silvaco TCAD will provide you the answer for all your white questions. So you can cut slice and see how the meshing is taking place inside your structure. And uh, one good feature is about like, you can even extract so many things even after your process steps, like you want to see your junction depth, okay? Uh, connective biasing conditions, sheet resistance, everything, everything you can extract from your, even from your, um, that is BP after uh, proceeding with all your process steps, okay? So just to let you uh, have some idea, I've discussed about this. Okay, before discussing about victory device, let us get back to the code and discuss on the um, victory mesh. Okay, so this is what we were defining. So we are going to call the uh, meshing structure over here. That is framework. We need to call the victory mesh. So as I mentioned earlier, victory process is a framework. Victory mesh is a framework. Victory device is a framework. Victory process is for process uh, simulator. Victory mesh for uh, remeshing, generation, and solid modeling. And then victory device is a device simulator. Okay, now we are calling the framework. Let us go victory mesh. Now. You, can, you may have a doubt, like, okay, how the integration is going to happen because I have created a structure using VP. Now I need to integrate it to the victory because I'm going to remesh the structure to make sure that I'm increasing the efficiency of my device. So what we can do is we can use the statement load and we are going to input because the same name is not only consisting of the layout file, but I have already mentioned you that it will be generating a structure file because we have done all the process steps. The final output will be a structure file. So that we are going to load it into the victory mesh. So we are using the load statement uh, here followed with in, that is we are inputting it, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Inputting the structure file, then as I told, 
in our case we are concerned about remeshing the structure what is being defined already using the vp that is victory process which has already been created using victory process okay so we are going to remesh the structure now comes the question okay whether we are going to use a cartesian based or we are going to use a unstructured based so as i think i have already showed you what is the difference between your um the conformal uh, that is cartesian based and unstructured based so uh, like i can suggest you i can suggest you that prefer for a delaunay meshing okay so that is delaunay meshing will be providing you with a tetrahedral structures okay as visible in this picture okay it will give you a tetrahedral structure which is going to give you a higher efficiency okay so it is it's not like conformable will not do definitely it will do but what happened you may end up with getting some convergence to avoid that we generally suggest to go with the delaunay meshing which is a perfect meshing for any kind of corner shape curved shape etc okay then i mean i told you uh this is what you could see here uh you could be will be having the maximum element size then we'll be going for refinement interface then junction refinement right same procedure we are going to follow it over here okay so i have uh, like uh, what to say i'll try to open because i have already simulated this code i'll show you the structure you may get some idea uh, the the other one currently running so let it run let us not disturb that <coughs> if you are running with me parallelly please allow it to run it may take some time okay so it's a 3d device so it takes some time uh, if you have a good uh, cpu processors more than four then i think simulation time is going to be very less for you so do not worry okay yeah okay this okay this input so let me just show you the structure here Mm. I'll I'll discuss this points and then come to the structure. Okay, so we are remeshing with Delaunay and then we are choosing the maximum size, then maximum size elements that is required for this Delaunay meshing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, everything by default micron. So if you are giving your input in nano, please make sure you convert micron to nano and give your input. Okay, uh, then we are going to refine uh, the uh, interface. with size and what distance that need to be specified over here that is interface at a distance true a distance of what that need to be specified here then we have uh, defined the maximum junction size so first we are setting up the max size elements then we are setting up the uh, fine meshing at the interface mm -hmm. and with along with the distance and then next we are setting up with the junction that is the uh, fine meshing at the junction region along with its distance then finally after uh, providing all these details we are going to save this structure so we use this stay save command you could see here it is out that is you are going to this is an output basically this is an output structure you are updating after the remeshing condition you are updating a final structure so this is an output so you use the command out which is equal to any user defined name that is you can give any name finfet1 finfet2 or fin or fet whatever it's a user user defined name followed with dot str is the extension this is what i told silvaco supports with the structure file extension of dot str okay so right now it is simulating this i'll go here and i'll show you how this structure looks like okay let me open here don't get confused i have saved this code in two different places so one place it is simulated and another place i'm showing you in live okay so um, you can just right click and give plot uh, finfet okay so automatically since it's a 3d structure tony plot 3d is open alternatively you can open it from here and it is you can see this is for uh, uh, tony plot 2d and 3d and you can open your like navigate to the place where the structure is present uh again i'm repeating make sure the layout file if you are incorporating it should be present in the tech code where it is the input file is present same folder 
if not the layout will not be called inside the simulator and it may pop up you with the error so make sure it is both are at the same location okay now let me just give it a slot <laughs> Yeah, so this is the structure actually we are uh, simulating here. It's uh, like, I, I think you people are also simulating parallelly with me, okay? So you could see the structure and uh, it comes with the uh, gate, drain, and then source. Don't get confused, all these are, we have already defined it. And uh, I'll show you with, uh, uh, after the biasing condition, I'll show how. And now I'll show you the meshing of it. Okay, you could see. This is the tetrahedral mesh that we have performed, okay? And uh, you could see different material names. If you are not con if you are not comfortable with the material name, you can always opt for selecting region wise. But my specification, my suggestion is, go for understanding with the material name, okay? So you could see how the meshing is being defined, okay? So this is the Delaunay meshing. We have given Delaunay, so it is an unstructured meshing, so that you can visualize it over here. Okay, fine. So all the X, Y, and Z axis is visible. This is X, this is Y, this is Z. Okay, all the axis is being visible. Okay, so we are given the so-and-so location, right? So um, maybe you can check it later. We, whatever we have defined only, the region will be generated. Till that region only, this device will be created. Okay, let me close this. Um, maybe after characterization if you have added some if you want to see some band structure or you want to see some potential difference uh, distribution or you want to see the electric field distribution so many things electron concentration hole concentration means you can all you can always see that in the uh, other part that is characterization part. okay right now we have created a structure using bp Okay, FinFET structure undergoing various process uh, steps, which is involving the major two steps of geometrical etching, geometrical deposition, and then diffusion with the, the time and temperature. Uh, by default, the tool takes the time in minutes. So if you want to give in seconds, please mention the time along with this uh, parameter seconds or hours means hours. Temperature by default, it is degree Celsius. So accordingly, you can, it's up to the user, you can adjust those parameters. Okay. Now, after doing all these, the structure, this is simulating right now, the structure will be saved and we can visualize. Now you may raise a question. Okay. Every time do I need to go right click, create, open the structure? Not necessary at all. Just you need to include a parameter that is statement called Tony plot 3D followed with your structure name. So uh, right now it has jumped to the next so, but I will try to, I'll show you. Tony plot 3D and you can have the structure name. <coughs> Excuse us. So, <coughs> if you include the statement, automatically, right now I'm going for right click and right. That's not necessary at all. Uh, if the statement is simulated, automatically the structure will be opened. Okay. So, but for our convenience to make sure that during us, uh, communication and I want it to, to pop up so that's the reason you can comment it so but if you if you are going for just include it as a single statement if it is a 2d you remove this 3d okay that is you just need to simply give it as tony plot structure name or plot name whatever it is right now it's a 3d structure so we used tony plot 3d okay now let us proceed uh, with the victory device so we are done with the victory mesh Next step is characterization. So we have undergone various process of using process simulator. We have redefined the mesh and we made sure that we gave the maximum elements inter in the interface, in the junction with our required distance. So all this is done, structure, final structure is created. Now that structure is taken forward to the device simulator. Now let us get back to the uh, spike. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Victory device, what is it capable of? It is capable of uh, characterizing the device, whatever we have uh, created, okay? So this is the place where we can perform a DC analysis, we can perform an AC analysis, transient analysis. So, uh, see, uh, I can say like, because yesterday we were seeing an optoelectronic simulation and today we are seeing an advanced development device simulation. So if you ask me a question, is Silvaco is narrowed down towards this application mean, then my answer is no. Because Silvaco supports for a wide range of application. It includes display concept, 
that is you have your thin film transistors you have your uh, uh, leds organic leds and then from the reliability perspective that is radiation analysis you can perform the single event effects anything gate rupture or uh, it is going to be absurd burnout or you are going for a total ion uh, dosing that is did model multiple strike that is also possible power perspective i can assure you that silvaco is the best known for all the power uh, compound materials like gan silicon carbide it supports for a great igbt devices etc and apart from this i think yesterday it's all you have visualized about the optical analysis because good thing about silvaco is they combine the not only the electrical characteristic but it also get uh, like linked with the optical characteristic for opto electronic based simulation and of course you could see uh, evident we are seeing the um, like novel devices like uh, development advanced development device like finfet channel fed fdsy everything everything under one roof yes so as i mentioned the number of physics models are available in silvaco victory uh, device simulator now you uh, i mean like the user give a raise a question okay of course there are number of physics models are available number of materials are available but still i i as a user coming up with a new model coming up with a new material is there any feature that can be uh, applicable or can be any feature to incorporate into the device simulator to visualize it then my answer is s yes, because silvaco uh, provides a, like a c interpreter template for the user to include their own model into the uh, device simulator check the impact of their device performance for the corresponding model and for material based um, number of materials like a single element it could be or a binary ternary quaternary a uh, number of conductors number of insulators number of organic materials are supported by silvaco uh, if time permits i'll show you the material list as well but i can say we are not restricted only the, to these materials if a user is coming up with a new material which is not as a default in the library definitely they can include it as a user defined material into the device and they can see the impact structure basic input they need to give they need to give the band gap of the material they need to give the permittivity which is which is readily available in their hand obviously when they start their research in a particular material they have the user have the basic material properties so which they can fed it to the uh, simulator and observe the um, impact on it okay apart from all these one good feature is about like okay i want to have a quick check on the circuit simulation okay in within the stcad field itself yeah any question i okay let us continue so how we can perform means we can use a mixed mode Uh, which is present inside the device simulator of victory device so we we have optimized a perfect device in our case so let us consider that we have optimized a fin fed prop oh, of fin okay we have optimized a perfect fin fed device okay now hello? we would yeah hello any questions ha main main niche hi aa raha hu kab se start hai उसमें Uh, circuit simulation and the uh, device simulation that uh, that is what we have characterized using TCAD tool, and we can have a quick check of a I can say a simple uh, uh, what to say circuit we can definitely have a look and obtain the characteristics. Okay, of course you may raise up a question. Okay, now I come with like going for a complex structure. How I can do because I need to fit my TCAD result into a spice simulator. Is there any possibility? Mean then my answer is yes. because silvaco comes uh, uh, for that perspective also they comes up with a tool called atmosphere which acts as a bridge between your tcad results to be linked directly to your spice because see if there is no bridge between tcad because you can 
directly take your ticket results, plug into your spy simulator, any spy simulator, and you cannot obtain your output, right? So you need some bridge between them. I can assure that globally, Silvaco is the one who provides a tool which acts as a bridge between a TCAD and a spy simulator, which will try to reduce, because if you don't have the bridge, obviously, uh, like researchers go for a, a very, very complex, very long algorithm. Right, they, they spend much time in updating that algorithm. Whereas Silvaco provides you with a tool within just a few steps you update with the, either it could be a standard model or a non-standard model, that, that's secondary, okay? You update with the spice parameters, which can be easily fed into a circuit simulator, any, any circuit simulator. So which makes your job so easy linking your TCAD, uh, that is the perfectly optimized device to any of your uh, circuit simulator okay but before that itself you want to have a quick check then please go for using this option called mix set mode circuit or device simulation that is combination of directly we can integrate it without any uh, like uh, complex uh, scripting so directly we can link it okay <coughs> Uh, so I'll complete the device uh, simulation code and then I'll get back to this BDF, VWF. Okay, let us jump over to the code. Okay, so it's right now it's simulating the victory device only. Now, uh, the next step is characterizing our FinFET, what we have created, right? So how we are going to characterize this means by means of using the framework called victory device. So we are calling the framework into the deck build plugin. So you could see one single window, you in you call, you do your process steps, you do your meshing steps, you do your characterization steps. So making it very simple for you, right? So we use go victory device. Now what, okay, what I'm gonna, uh, like which file, which file I'm going to integrate it means the file, the mesh condition without any change in the mesh, I'm going to use this in file. It is, I'm going to uh, call the structure file. So we are not varying this meshing anymore. So I'm taking the same structure of same mesh. Okay. And then uh, we will be uh, going to uh, include the various physics model in it. And then uh, we'll be using uh, the electrodes. If we haven't defined earlier, we can define it alternatively in victory device as well. Okay, there is a parameter called verbose here, which will help you, I can say, um, gives you with a higher level of diagnostic runtime pretty. That is, yeah. uh, like, you can use this verbose in VP as well. That is, the printing into the files, no, obviously when it is running, it will be printing into the file. So, it increases the simulation time. So, it is, it, like, for example, if you are running in VP, we cannot recommend to run oxidation simulation with verbose. Like, it, it takes much time. So, we need to make sure we use this verbose effectively for enabling a higher level of diagnostic runtime printing. Okay. Next is, I haven't defined a substrate earlier in my VP. That is, in uh, you have the flexibility of defining an electrode either in during your process steps itself. Alternatively, you can define it in your big tree device. So uh, it's it's up to the user only. Okay, makes your job so easy. How do we define this uh, electrode in uh, big tree device? Means the statement is electrode. Okay. <coughs> you are going to define the name of the electrode. So in our case, it is going to be substrate. Which position? Which position? That is, it's a three-dimensional device, right? So in x-axis, which position this electrode should start and should end? And similarly, in the y-axis, in which position it should start and it should end? And similarly, in z-axis, in which position it should start and it should end? Okay? So we are starting at zero. So you may get a call, like, okay, just, is it a random value? Definitely no. You know, previously we have created the structure and uh, initially itself all these uh, positions we have given. So we make mm -hmm. sure the position value, whatever you give, should lie within the same range only. If you give something different over here, which is not included in your structure, which goes away from your structure means, the um, device tool will pop up you with an error. So make sure the position, the selection that what you do is within the range which you have already predefined. If not, you can vary it in your 
earlier structure. That's, that's fine. Okay. But you can't after it, it will pop up if you go away. For example, I haven't defined my x. I have defined my x there. Z axis is still 0.45 only. Okay. But uh, like uh, what happened? Uh, point 0.5, sorry. If I go beyond point uh, that is 1, then obviously it won't, right? So make sure it comes spawns under the same category. Okay. Next, we are giving a contact which is, uh, that is, we have already created a gate, right? So for that gate, you're giving the work function and, you know, it's by default, it is in terms of electron old, okay? So simply just give the value. Next step, uh, you like, I would like to mention over here. Okay, can I write the electron statement first and then call this mesh statement next means, then my answer is no. Here also, there is a proper flow that we need to take into consideration, okay? So first, mesh if you have already defined just in just call that machine call the structure that's it then go for using uh defining uh undefined electrodes here you can define then you can give the contact contact can be given only in the device simulator okay so you can give the contact along with its work function after that you are going to specify the model this is the flow mesh uh electro definement contact model method <coughs> you may come up with a question okay this in fact what i'm showing is involving process simulation for process concern person if i am a device concern person what should i do means you can create first step meshing declaration then second step you see a region uh, the structure what you're creating no different regions will be there for different material that declaration then again the same electrode contact model that's not going to differ only these two will be Differing. Apart from that, the procedure is going to be the same. Okay. So contact, we are giving the work function over here. And then uh, we'll have a model, physics model. This is FinFET. So you know FinFET will be taking the basic models of MOSFET. So you will have the SRH here. We have already defined the doping in our process step. So I'm using a concentrated uh, SRH model over here. Okay. Uh, so then uh, we can use the uh, CVT. So uh, the syntax CVT means do not get confused. It's a Lombardi model, okay? The syntax for using the Lombardi model. Uh, that is, we are going to combine the model accounting for the doping, the temperature, and of course, uh, any uh, inversion layer difference, okay? And then, uh, of course, you use uh, some user may go ahead with the Kaizen model, CVT model. Yes, for that, the uh, syntax would be Kaizen CVT. In this case, if it is simple mentioned as CVT means it is going to take the Lombardi model. Okay, so do not worry. Uh, like you can check it out in our manual. You will be having all the what say the models present. So I'll just quickly show. I'm not going to show inside. I'll just show you the uh, content. So you will get some idea. So this is the place. So you can see. As I mentioned, for all the models available in Silvaco, you can find each and every equation present in it. Okay, so you can uh, check this. You can see, for example, I'm just quickly randomly selecting some model. Okay, so I'll go for, yeah. So you could see what are the parameters taken into consideration, what are the equations in, involved in it, everything will be given inside. So you can have a quick check what are all the uh, models that is available in Silvaco. So you could see because, uh, for example, if you are a person working on a power device like hemp, okay, and very specific, you are going for a GAN hemp. Obviously, you need a, if you are using for this GAN material, you need a high field mobility model, right? So uh, you can check uh, high field mobility model like GAN set, FMC3, all these in all. And few cases, you may be going for a low mobility model. You may be going for a tunneling model. Um, like you could see generation recombination model, thermal models, okay, boundary conditions, so many things are there and everything comes under one roof, okay. You can always check this. Whenever you have time, you can always have check. Okay, now in our condition, I'm going for a simple con SRH model and then I'm going for a, a CBT Lombardi model followed with the Fermi model, okay. And then this print option is nothing but I want to see what all the parameters that was taken into consideration for the defined models in the runtime output. To analyze that, I'll show you. To analyze that, I'm just using the print option here. <coughs> um, 
actually to go backward uh, you can just uh, click the scroll to button so what happened means if you click to scroll to button if it is selected it shows at what line it is simulating right now i want to see previous case what it has simulated so i'm just navigating to the same by unchecking it yeah this is what i was mentioned so this is like when you call the victory device you can see what are the modules because I told Victory Device is a framework, but which involves uh, several, um, like depending upon your purchase, or well, different modules will be available, 2D and 3D. Accordingly, it will show. Then this is the structure we have uh, defined. That is, we have uh, loaded, right? But that structure it will show you how many nodes and the points are there. Why do I specify this? Means at times it's it's not about everyone. You they go for a complete meshing for the device. As I mentioned earlier, I agree. They go for a, a fine meshing will always increase the accuracy of our performance, but efficiency is to be balanced, right? That is also most important to mention, to maintain that we make sure a structure involves a perfect fine meshing at the required region. And apart from that, all other places, a core meshing is suggested. Okay, so if so you can check this nodes and the data header, that's we are using Deloney, so it is data header. Okay, so how many nodes, how many points are there? If it is too much, you may end up with getting convergence. I will try, I'll check if this code is having any convergence issue. I'll show that also. Um, and depending upon the method, what you're using, what happened means the good thing about Silvaco is it automatically it just take the small bias and without any manual sitting, it tried to rectify the conversion issue, okay? I'll check if some cases is there, I'll definitely explain you in detail, okay? So in our case, this is the, for example, if you're getting convergence error, future you're going to work with TCAT, Silvaco TCAT, and uh, you're facing so-and-so condition means, make sure we need to check this uh, points. This is very, very important. This should be sufficient, it should not be very high, okay? So we'll be taking care of this then, how many electrodes have been defined will be shown over here. And then how many regions, because we saw material wise, right? How many region actually created in the structure is 10 regions. Then machine type, Delaney. So it gives you the points for each and every region you could see. <coughs> okay, now the victory device 3D simulated. It's a 3D simulation. So the electro, you could see the electrode contact and then uh, you can see the models. Since you gave the print option, you can see all the uh, more, this, uh, the parameter related to these models uh, will be displayed over here. So in this case also, we can see that uh, what are the material we have chosen and what are all the basic properties because see a user may want to change their like, like for example, a material property, right? So they can use it by using, including a statement called material into it, and they can easily uh, vary these syntaxes. But I'm just giving you a quick idea. So when you see, if I take HFO2, what is the epsilon value of it? What is the band gap? What is this chi value? Everything is mentioned over here for every material. You can have a quick look. And apart from the various parameters, which is included for these models, what we are choosing will be displayed. If you include the print option in your model statement. So you could see, since we have used Lombardi model, you can see what are the parameters taken into consideration. Okay, now after this model declaration, we are moving on with the method. Okay, we are going to solve the uh, passing conditions, right? So we need to choose a proper method to make sure that the device is properly converged and providing us with the better results. So from that perspective, uh, the method statement is the one which where we are going to include all the um, or say methods that we are going to use. That is, in our case, I'm using this uh, PAM GM RES. What does this mean? It's a parallel, I can say it's a parallel iterative solver. Um, uh, majorly it is used for when we go for a, like a, a calculation for a conductivity matrix in 3D simulations, okay? Apart from that, if it is a simple 2D simulation, I would suggest that the best method to go is called Newton. And because it's a strongly coupled uh, method, I can say, uh, apart from that, you have Gummel, you have Block, 
uh, and you are very specific that you are going to perform any breakdown analysis you have called c limit there are so many again you can always check it in the manual and as per your break in future whenever you need when you are uh, working on silvago tcad you can always have a check with the different methods available combination of the methods is also possible okay in our case i'm going to we are going to perform a 3d structure so i'm choosing this um, pam.gmrs which is going to be a good fit for a 3d simulation then we have max traps what is this max traps means uh, it is the one which is going to specify the number of times the trap procedure will be repeated in a case of a divergence okay um, obviously this value should lie between 1 and 1 to 10 okay so we need to make sure that we are giving between 1 to 10 then we have it limit it limit is it's a parameter which specifies the number of uh, i can say the maximum number maximum number of allowed loop that is uh, newton loop gummel loop we say right the iteration that is the maximum number which is allowed is is what your it limit again it's not the fixed value user can easily uh, just these values then uh, we have uh, db max that is nothing but the um, old age steps i can say and uh, uh then we have that is it, it says the maximum allowed potential okay and then we have carrier two uh this is carr it's a simple format but if you want you can write it as carrier so there are like carriers will specify the number of carrier continuity equation that will be solved okay so the conditions are only three it, uh, it takes a value of zero one or it will take the value of two what does that zero indicate it means it implies that the poisson equation will be solved that's the meaning if the specific carrier is equal to 2 sorry 0 then if the specific carrier is equal to 1 then we must specify whether the whether it has to solve the continuity equation for electrons or we need to mention whether it is working for holes so if it is working for both electron and holes in that case we will give the carrier to be equal to 2 so only 0 1 2 is possible 0 um that uh, will give you with the uh, Poisson equation to be solved. One, you need to choose whether it is a hole or electron. Uh, if it is two, it is going to be both, combination of them. Then we have norm dot scaling dot local. What is this? Means uh, I can say they are non dimensionalized. That is, they can be scaled. Okay. That is scaled by with respect to the cell volume. Uh, like, this is, I can say this condition is applicable when you go for a 3D simulation. For a story, you can skip. Just simple give method to be equal to, that is method, Newton, that's it. Since it is 3D, we are taking all these small, small features into consideration to make sure our device performance is perfect. Okay. Then, <coughs> excuse us. We go for initial solving. What is this initial solving? I'll go back here to the code. So initial solving in this case, in this is 3D, right? So it takes the initial, that is initial condition for the bias. Uh, will be working on the method of Newton, okay? And if it is 2D, it will be taking by default as Gummel, okay? Then it will move on to the next level of method. So it will solve previous means taking the initial condi condition into uh, consideration, proceeding with the next step, okay? So here, this is... This two, this three lines will first focus. What is this three lines means? We are setting up a drain voltage. So to that is we are fixing a drain voltage. That is the meaning. So when we are fixing the drain voltage, we use the solve statement and we specifies the voltage and drain specifies the electrode name. Okay. Um, similarly, if you are giving, if you are defining it as drain one, then here the name should be drain one. Again, this is use the defined name, okay? So, whatever the name you are given for the electron, make sure you are using it over here. Then, what is the value? That is 0 0.01 volt. By default, the tool takes the value in volt, okay? So, I have fixed the drain voltage and ramp, I'm going to ramp the uh, gate voltage, okay? Considering the previous initial bias conditions, what we have simulated earlier. So, solved. Okay, uh, that is we are going to solve. I'm sorry, we are going to solve the uh, drain here. Okay, and uh, from step size of 0.1 till the final voltage of 0.05 volt. 
okay so previous what does it mention means this value so after uh, fixing 0.01 from 0.01 with an increment of again 0.01 that is 0.02 0.03 0.04 0.05 till it reaches 0.05 this uh, voltage will be ramping you may have a question do i need to go for fixing do i need to go for fixing the uh, ramping the value it's again up to the user you can uh, give it as a fixed value or you can simply ramp it just to show you how this two features works we are i am trying to show you with the two statements okay now in this case it is idvg characteristics so we are fixing the drain voltage and then we are going to ramp the gate voltage so again uh, this is again as i told you can ramp or you can give point twice that is also fine okay i'll show you well i'll show you the runtime explain you the runtime output i'll show you how this is been working okay so we are going to so i'll come to the statement after explaining this okay we have solved Uh, we get uh, uh, that is voltage of the gate electrode to be 0.01 volt, and uh, we are solving it till the final of one volt with a step size of 0.05 with the electrode name which is going to be gate and need to be taking into previous conditions. That is what it's meaning. Okay, I am fixing that sweeping the drain voltage. Okay, that is at which means at drain voltage of 0.05. i'm going to extract the iv characteristic idvg characteristic of uh, the finpad device where will my data will be saved means the data will be saved in uh, the log file which includes a statement called log followed with because you are going to save the output correct so it is going to take the name of out file or simply you can give it as out f which allows you with the user defined file name with an extension of dot log okay that is log file it is a log file so uh, uh, this uh, i can say that they, um, you may have a doubt okay will silvaco support only dot log silvaco support with dot uh, dat also that is dat data file but uh, while you are simulating all this you can take the dot log file okay so it will be saved in the this is the file which will be consisting the uh, current characteristic also because it's a idvg curve which has been generated for a drain volt of 0.05 volt so for that all those uh, ramp condition will be saved in this dot log file okay now you could see an option called log off what does it mean it means okay i am done with this step now i'm going to go for a new step so i don't want the new step to overlap my previous log file so what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn off this log file which i have initiated okay so you are turning off the log file next the next steps which you are going to uh, carry out will not affect this, this log file that's the meaning it will not overwrite it okay so to avoid that to avoid overwriting we are turning off the log statement okay so this is about idvg characteristic i think idvg is already been generated okay anyway uh, i'll open and i'll show you that's why the next step what we are going to do is again we are uh, solving the initial step and uh, we are considering the previous biasing conditions and we are going for uh, in this case it is idvd characteristics so when you are performing idvg characteristic we need to make sure we fix the drain voltage and sweep the gate voltage okay if you are doing idvd characteristic you fix your gate voltage and drain and sweep your drain voltage so from that perspective so i'm going to fix my voltage as 1 with a step size of 0.05 you may arise with a question okay what and i simply mention it as solve uh, v gate is equal to 1 of course the tool will do but our suggestion is it is good rather than giving it everything as one Short, it is advisable to split and simulate it, then combine. Okay, so that's what this this particular line is doing. So we are going to fix it for one volt, but step by step, slowly we are simulating it to avoid any convergence issue. Okay, so we are going to sweep the gate voltage from zero to one volt with a step size of point zero five. While I open the log file, I'll make you understand how this is working. Then. 
I told we are fixing the gate voltage, sweeping the drain voltage. So the same here, again, you may arise with a question, do I need to go for these kind of fixing? It's up to the user just for an understanding. Because see, uh, a, it's a tool, right? So of course it automatically corrects its conversion, but when you are feeding an input, when you're giving an input, make sure that you give in a smaller size, step size. So the conversion could be very fast, very easy. Okay, so from that perspective, we are starting with 0 0.001 volt, then then it goes solving for the V that is voltage of drain of 0 0.01 volt, then for 0.5, then it sweep till one volt with the step size of 0 0.05. Now you know I remember uh, this log file will be saving all these data inside this log file and I'm going to close this log off that is I'm going to turn off this log file. You may arise with the question okay I'm setting the gate voltage and I'm sweeping the drain voltage for IDVT characteristic. Can I include this log file after this solve statement of drain mean then my answer is no because whatever we are sweeping we need to make sure it is included in the log file so if you specify if you cut and give this log here as the next statement then i will say whatever you are ramping will not be saved in this log file so if the details so you could have seen I was sweeping this gate voltage, but I didn't use any log file before because uh, it, I'm going to fix it. I, I don't want to see the sweep in my log file. So that's the reason I have, I'm not using the log uh, statement before it. But here, when I'm sweeping the drain voltage, I make sure that uh, the values are saved and visible, viewed, can could be viewed later in the log file, okay? And um, in, this, uh, in this case, V, I told V will be specifying about the voltage. It's suppose in some cases people go for, uh, what is a current uh, variation and all, right? That's also uh, possible in Sivaka. So that, in that case, it will be I, I represent current, followed with the gate, uh, I mean the electrode load, that's it. So now after this, it will be turned off. And once after all your simulation is done, either you can use the Tony plot command, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if it is Tony plot 2D, that is because our plots and all will be in 2D, X, Y, right? So you can use simple as Tony plot statement followed with the uh, log file name, okay? So right now it is simulating this IDVD. So I'll try to show you IDVD. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the log file name. Okay, so let us open this. I'll run this. So you could see uh, the log file, that is the IDVG characteristics of this pinfed device. And this provides you with the current and this provides you with the gate voltage. And uh, right click, you can see the X quantity uh, because every time it's not what the IV character that you want to visualize, right? Um, from IV itself, you can extract several parameters, right? Transconductance is there. Uh, so many things, up threshold swing is there, ion is there, ion is there, so many things are there. So you can always check it out in your X quantity and you can select your proper Y quantity. Okay, this is DZ analysis. So, so suppose you are going for an AZ analysis. You have two different chart. You can see this polar chart and you can see the Smith chart. The scattering parameters will be there, right? So you, you can always check, select which type of chart that you want to visualize. So these things are all like, these are common things that I want to specify. Okay, so this is about the IDVD character, IDVG characteristics of the FinFET device that we are actually simulating. Okay, so uh, I think it is uh, simulating for the gate voltage uh, for the IDVD characteristic. Okay, I want to show something over here. <coughs> okay, I'll go to the IDVG characteristic which we had before previously. Yeah, yeah this is. So this is the IDVG VG characteristic, right? So we were setting up the drain voltage. I'll show to that level. Yeah. Solved 0 0.01. So it is solving 0 0.01. And you could see the method used is shown here. Okay. Uh, uh, Pam JMRS used the Newton method for solving. It's a good suggested method. 
for 3D. If it is 2D, simply Newton will do. So you could see the value of it. And then you could see, this is the drain voltage we have set, right? So this will be displayed here. And then next is point, uh, we are going to ramp it till 0 0.05 with a sub size of 0 0.01. So you could see, I have used the term called previous. So previous is what? 0 0.01. So what happened? That simulator, when we include previous statement, jumps directly to the next step size, that is 0 0.02. And it simulates. And then 0 0.03. 0 0.04 after reaching 0 0.05 it it move on to the next line so after reaching the final voltage of 0 0.05 it switch it moves to the next line so a log file is called here in which our gate voltage will be the sweeping of the gate voltage will be saved along with its current value so gate of 0 0.01 in this one uh, a good interesting factor if this is if people are quite having some idea about TK, they must be aware about it so the drain voltage, we have fixed the drain voltage of 0 0.05 volt, right? So that is fixed. Now we are sweeping the gate voltage, okay? So this continues until what voltage we are given? One volt with the step size of 0 0.05, okay? So it is 0 0.01, now it is done. We have used the statement previous, so it jumps to the next point size, which is 0 0.05. Then you could see it simulates until it reaches the one volt. So this is point eight, this is point eight five, point nine, and this is one. After one volt, then it will jump on to the next statement that is log. So let us see. Log off. You could see that Tony plot is not set because I I entered this Tony plot statement later only. Uh, so to, it is good like you can enter it later and uh, run by right clicking uh, the run option. But this is not applicable for other commands. Okay. So only for Tony plot because we have already simulated, already created, and it is kept in the folder. You are going to see it. That's it. The next step. Okay. You can see it starts with sol initial and then goes for the initial previous guess. What it will take into consideration. Then we have the gate sweeping that's been performed right now. So first value is 0 0.05 and this has to simulate until it reaches one volt. So we could see, so it is simulating, currently it is simulating. It's in 0 0.9, still 0 0.95 and then it will be one volt. After that, it jumps to the next level of next line for simulation. Okay, so this is about the IDVD characteristic and IGVT characteristic. So since I've already simulated uh, another place, I will show you the file as well. If you want, you can open it by means of using Tony plot comment or directly go to this log file statement, right click on this dot log, plot finfit, just give that file name. That's it. You may have a question. Okay, uh, it has opened, but it is showing only IDVT, but we performed IDVT. Simple, go to display, change here x quantity because my uh, y quantity is the same. I want the drain current, but x quantity I want it to be drain voltage. Just select give apply. So this will be your IDVD characteristic for the FinFET device what we are currently simulating. And if this is linear scale, you want to see in your log scale, you just click on this log and give apply. That's it. Okay. So right now this is, I'll give in linear scale. So this is the IDVD characteristic that being simulated using victory device. So I've just given you a, a simple idea about uh, IDVG and IDVD creation. But apart from this, what else you can do means uh, you can overlay the plots. For example, you're going for various drain conditions. You are sweeping this gate voltage and you want to see in one single plot, then you have an option called uh, overlay. And apart from that, you want to have a comparative check with different models. Okay. Um, is that possible to overlay and compare it? I mean, then that is also possible. Um, if time permits, I will try to at least show you the picture once. Okay. <coughs> I'll see any example is there in our 
So that is one three gig bit bit I'll show. <coughs> Excuses. You can check this deck code, and this is what I told. So for various models that you want to overlay and have a quick comparison, yes, you can do that. And yeah, you could see this is also possible by means of using Silvaco. But right now, what we are simulating is one fixed uh, drain voltage for uh, drain sweep to see, and uh, one fixed gate voltage for IDVD characteristic sweeping. That's it. Okay. And the same code after your DC analysis, you can continue with your AC analysis by including your frequency conditions. Okay. If you're going for RF, you want to extract some. Um, or say RF parameters like oscillation frequency, maximum oscillation frequency, cutoff frequency, gain you want to see, or admittance parameters or uh, impedance parameters, capturing parameters, everything, everything, uh, uh, small circuit analysis, all these, you know, like if you want to see those individually, you can, you need to perform your AC simulation here. And uh, if you want to perform transient, then you can carry out transient by ramping your time. Yeah. Okay, but I'm just giving you a general idea of what will the uh, uh, device simulator of Silvaco is capable of doing it. Okay, okay. So with this, I'll move on with the slide again. Mm, this is a good thing that I want to discuss. Okay, so uh, we have seen VP, we have seen uh, victory mesh, we have seen victory device. That's fine. Okay, now comes with the user. Okay, I'm a user and I would like to perform optimization of various parameters. But every time do I, because with 3D simulation, I told it takes time, right? So will I require to go and change each and every parameter every time and visualize it and take the tool means? Then suggestion from Silvaco and from our end is that we have a dedicated tool to perform this optimization and design of experiments for various parameters, which is going to make your job very easy. That's called as virtual wafer fab. It is in simple terms. We call it as BWF. So it is a software that is required for performing the design of experiments, as I mentioned, and optimization experiments. That is number of algorithm, like you have genetic algorithm, you have LM algorithm, so many algorithms are there where you would like to um, perform uh, optimization of a single target. I, I should not say single target. It's called scalar target. Okay. Or you are going to perform optimization of a vector target. What does it, what I mean means, uh, I guess it is visible. Okay. So let us consider in our case itself. We were doing several process steps. We were doing several characterization steps. If a user, as a user, you are coming and you would like to, like you, you want to optimize your device. Every time, changing the time, changing the temperature. For example, diffusion. We are going for a diffusion. Changing time, changing temperature. It's a long process. What you can do? You can incorporate exact the deck build code into your virtual way for fact and select the parameters that you would like to vary. That is... You, you're going to set up a range. You're not going to give one fixed value. You're going to set up a range. For example, if I have time of 15 minutes, I will design the range to be 5 to, 5, uh, 5 to 20 minutes. Uh, what will be my possible optimization result for uh, a target? Well, for example, if I'm going for a victory device, uh, let us say we are going to optimize the work function. Okay, We need to select the work function parameter and we are going to setting up the range so you don't know for example as a user we don't we will keep on working on optimization of work function to see which is going to give us the best performance device right performance of the device instead of that simple job what we can do is we are going to select the parameter which we are going to vary in the vwf and then we are going to select the target for example um let us take ion and go i'm what will be the impact of a work function on the on current so that's what this particular uh, example, what I'm trying to uh, let you know. So I'm choosing a parameter that is work function. I'm going to vary it. For example, I want to vary it from 4 to 4.5 electron volt. And I want to see, I, I need a current value of very close to, like, say, um, 5, uh, what to say, uh, milliampers or, like, so and so. So I'm just giving you a rough idea. You fix the target value. 
you just simply give the range of the parameter that you want to verify and run the simulation. You can see the nodes here, okay? Parallelly, like for all the ranges, what it is simulating, the tool will start running and the best on current, it's not only on current, you're not restricted. You can go, you can set your target as subthreshold swing, or you can set your target as uh, uh, off current leakage current, or you can set your target as uh, threshold voltage, whatever it could be. I'm just giving you an idea only. Parallelly, you can uh, run this in one single window that's called virtual wafer fab, which means it is going to make your job so simple without wasting your time. Parallelly, all these ranges will be done and the results will be displayed. Okay, so, okay. What does this virtual wafer fab supports for? Means it supports the Silvaco's process device, even the circuit simulation input. You can give it over here. Uh, you can optimize it and take it back. Okay. So this is one place where you can like how it's also very simple to use because it's a GUI based. So one good thing about Silvaco, it's like for beginners, it's a gift. Like we are not going to depend only on the uh, scripting. Obviously, scripting is very simple, but still. If someone is very new, very like in the starting level, they can always use this GUI features of Silvaco tools. And they in here also, virtual way for fab is also a GUI based tool that also enables the examination of the experimental results. Okay, so I think we have seen the FinFET uh, demo showing you the structure creation, uh, remeshing, and then showing you the IDVG characteristic and IDVD characteristics. But I would like to show you a few of the like FinFET application, which uh, has been already simulated since it's due to the time constraint, we can't run all, right? So quick screenshot of the same. So you could see this is uh, like the FinFET's fully uh, unstructured tetrahedral mesh being used for various models. And then this is for the FinFET strain analysis that has been performed. And you are using a uh, silicon germanium based material and the compressive strain along with the strain, how the effect is visualized, how the effect is characterized is being sh shown here. The comparison is shown here. That is uh, with and without stress. So this gives you, this is what I told, overlay. You can overlay the plots and compare easily. This is about the velocity overshoot effect, uh, just to show you a quick uh, screenshot of the same. And this is about including the quantum confinement effect into the uh, FinFET device. Again, uh, resulting in a decrease of the current. You could see the different model drift diffusion. This is a uh, worm quantum model. So which is giving the better results that you can compare and have a quick analysis. Okay, so with this, we are coming to the end of this session. Uh, so let, let me just quickly give you a few words about uh, who is Cognitive Design Technology, whom we are and what we do. Cognitive Design Technology is a high-tech solution provider for a multidisciplinary cavities. It's, we are not restricted only with these um, display devices or advanced development devices. We also work with the MEMS, IC design, and embed assistant development. And we have successfully designed, developed, and deployed many solutions for our customers in these areas. And of course, we have a very good team, technical team, and um, uh, what is a business team who implement our sales activities by providing to customers a next step for the customized solution for their needs. Okay, so with this, let me just consolidate our uh, session and then we'll carry on with our questioning session. So, Victory, it's a unified platform which is built from the ground up. You can perform a one dimensional, two dimensional, and three dimensional. Always you can take up your victory results to uh, device characterization, or you can perform your RC extraction as well. As I mentioned, uh, uh, victory that is Silvaco TCAD tool comes up with a very good support for the adaptive meshing. And uh, we are not constrained, as I've already mentioned, we are not constrained to any particular application. We find our application, we have been useful for various applications, including the display, power, reliability, optical, and advanced devices. And we not like think that only these devices have been supported, just, just to give you, because this is all like popularly known, so we have just uh, given the same, but we are not limited to these uh, devices. We, we work with number of devices and we encourage the user to incorporate their model also, their material also into the tool. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, 
too technical, you can always drop your uh, mail uh, with uh, info at cognitivetech.coroutine. And if you have any inquiry, you can always drop your mail at sales at cognitivetech.coroutine. I think I we have our uh, technical team who have also joined the session. Um, I guess they would have at least addressed your questions. If not, we'll be, I think it's time for us to uh, discuss our questions. Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful session. Now I am reading questions on behalf of the participants. Okay. So the first question is, if uh, this is the question from Dr. B. Rajesh Kumar, <coughs> if okay. real need to be changed, what is the option to select and how to input user defined for new material? Okay, great. Um, so user defined new material. Okay, let me share my screen. I would like to uh, show the person concerned person about how it is going to be very simple for adding up a new material. Just a quick second. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You where did you send it to? <laughs> So this is about, you can see, if a user is coming up with a new material, okay? So they can simply include it in the device simulator even just by using uh, material property with, they need to like, for example, what they have to do is, in the region st statement, they need to simply give the position at which the region need to be created, followed with the name of the material. Please don't get confused since it is given as silicon two, silicon one. Uh, any user defined, I can say graphene. Graphene, if you take, you can give the name as graphene here. Now, after yeah. it, yes, your screen is not visible. Okay, I'm sorry. One second. Is my screen is visible? I think I have shared. Is it visible now? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So you can, I'll just go navigate to this user defined, right? Okay. Yeah. So basically, what are the details that is required means the user must be known about which group it comes under. Either it is a semiconductor, insulator, or conductor, what they are going to include. Okay. After that, what is the material name? Again, the material name is of user's choice. What is the syntax? Means syntax is going to be simply in the region statement. We give the position of those uh, material. Then we give user dot material, the material name. Okay. And then we are going to include a new statement called material under which I told like the basic properties we need to include, right? Like the silly band gap or the permittivity. These are basic material which the user will be having in their hand. So those material they will be incorporating. Do not worry about the syntax. Everything will be available in the uh, manual itself. So I'll just be sure. By means of using two sentence, simple sentence, one region defining, another material property inclusion. With this, they can uh, define the user defined material. <coughs> if there is any question still, if they have any confusion, they can definitely ask me. If not, we'll move on with the next question. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, one more question from okay. Mr. Ajay Kumar. Uh, okay. Where I can, uh, where I can get the latest version of user manual, especially Silvaco Atlas? Mm, this is completely for our uh, prestigious customers. Okay. So if they have the proper licensing of Silvaco, uh, they can easily download it. Uh, we be actually from our end we provide. If not, we tell them how to update it. So it's going to be very simple because you can't uh, extract it from Google. This is only meant for our prestigious customers. They can easily get it. If they don't know how to, if they are uh, our existing customer, and if they don't know how to extra, uh, access it, mean they can please drop us a mail and we will immediately provide them with a link for the download.
Thank you, ma'am. Last question is how to define a defect, say a double acceptor type defect, along with its label, with respect to valence band, maxima conduction band, minima and sildaco. That's a perfect question. That's a perfect question. So this uh, defect definition will be included in the device simulator. So in our our case it is going to be victory device so in that it will be included uh, with the statement called defect so the thing is like i can't give you one single parameter because it will be uh, having several parameters that need to be included under the defect statement so there are several examples in Sulvaco website they can easily go through it for the defect statement if not uh, you can if they have the access if they are I mean, again i'm saying if they have the access for the user manual under defect statement, whatever they are expecting can be defined, but the syntax will be given, okay? So they don't want to go for like uh, uh, randomly giving some parameter. That's, that tool definitely will not accept for it. All the parameters which is to be included can be defined using a defect statement. Like how we gave the material property for a user defined material in a material statement, right? Likewise, all the defect parameters can be defined in a defect statement. That comes under victory device simulator. So they can define it before the method statement. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So thank you. we will take a short break here and return here at 5 p.m. to conduct the quiz session. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks to the committee. Wonderfully organized. Thank Thanks you. to all. Thank you. Uh, the quiz is compulsory for all the participants. Please kindly note that. And by 5 o'clock, maybe we will start the quiz. This is vote of thanks. Good, uh, good evening, all. I'm honored to have the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the IMUP IDI team, IIT Guwahati, with more than 250 participants from the colleges and institutions across India from various fields of science and technology. The online feminization workshop on nanotransistor and energy device technology is hereby <laughs> successfully concluded. On the behalf of IMUP team, first and foremost, I want to express my gratitude to mighty Government of India for showing confidence in ITG team with all the funding support and invaluable advices. My heartfelt gratitude goes to a director for his active support and encouragement. I'd like to thank all the eminent speakers who spend their precious time sharing their valuable knowledge in the field of excellence through the INUP I2I program. I would also like to thank our head of the Center for Nanotechnology for being the constant source of support for all the activities of the center. In addition, we have a group of experienced and energetic faculty members in the center towards whom we are extremely grateful. Moreover, the constant support we receive from our staff uh, members of our center is commendable. I thank them all. Last but not the least, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the pillars of the workshop, the organizing team, technical team, anchoring team, finance team, students, and every other person making this three-day workshop successful. Once again, thank you all very much again. Thank you. Our quiz will begin at 5 p.m., so be ready for that. And it's compulsory for all the participants. <laughs> 